We are live. Okay, and I have six o'clock. So with that, we're live and at six o'clock. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, open this meeting and call us to order and ask Council Member Bracco to please lead us in the pledge. Yes, as we uh, approach 4th of July, uh, let us remember what it means when oh, some great, great men uh, decided we no longer wanted to be ruled by a king. And these men met in Philadelphia and pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. And most of them died doing it. So let us remember them and please join me in the pledge. Ready, salute. I pledge, pledge allegiance, I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and to, and to the, the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, council member. Invocation, we have none. Council members, can you mute yourselves if you're not um, in a position of speaking? All right, and I will move on to city clerk's report on posting the agenda and roll call. Tonight's meeting agenda was posted on Monday, June 28th at 3.42 p.m. Um, Council member Armendariz. Present. Council member Bracco. Here. Council member Hilton. Here. Council member Laura Munoz. Present. Council member Marks. Here. Council member Tovar. Here. And Mayor Blankley. Here. Okay. Um, under orders of the day, I don't think we have anything there. Speak up, guys, if there's if there's something. Otherwise, I'm moving into the usual announcement I have to make. All council members are participating remotely pursuant to the governor's executive order number N2920 in order to minimize the spread of the COVID-19 virus. The meeting is being live streamed from the city website, cityofgilroy.org and is viewable on cable channel 17 and on Facebook Live. Public comments can be made during the meeting by watching the meeting online on Zoom at https colon forward slash forward slash rb dot gy forward slash h i t s n j or by calling 669-900-6833 using meeting ID 816-4315-4970 and passcode 059431. When I call the item you wish to speak on, press star nine on your telephone keypad or use the raise your hand icon. All right, next is employee introductions. We have none and ceremonial items. We have none. Uh, proclamations, awards, and presentations. We have a presentation by David Matuzak of the Historic Heritage Committee, the annual presentation to the council. I don't know if you're joined by Kathy Chavez or not, but David, we are prepared for you to go. Okay, thank you. And I'd like to thank Cindy McCormick who will be doing the slides. Uh, it is my honor as the chair of the Historic Heritage Committee to present the committee's activities over the past 18 months and our upcoming work plan for the next two years. The purpose of the Historic Heritage Committee is to act as an advisory body to the City Council and the Planning Commission on issues related to historic preservation in the city of New York. Hey, Dave. You're yeah. a little hard to, I just want to interrupt you for just a sec. Do you have Facebook or anything else running at the same time? No. Okay. There's a, it's, it's a little bit muffled, but we can hear you. Okay. I'll get a little closer to the speaker. All right. The purpose of the uh, committee is to act as advisory body to the city council and the planning commission. Our committee members include myself, Kathy Chavez as the vice chair and Ian Brussoff was one of the newest committee members. Also honored to work with Fabia Morales Medina, our planning commission representative and councilwoman Rebecca Armendariz, our newly appointed council rep. Also like to thank Peter, who has served as our council rep until just recently. 
During the 2020 and 2021 calendar years, the Heritage Committee was involved in the update of the city's historic resource inventory and contact statement. We also reviewed two facade improvements in our historic downtown, and we welcomed two new members and our new council representative. We also completed a training recently on our bylaws and decision-making during our public meetings. Over the next two years, we will continue to review projects that affect our historic resources, participate in updating the historic ordinance as part of the overall update of the zoning code. We will also begin some community outreach regarding adding and removing properties from the inventory and begin some compliance review for the Mills Act contract properties. An update to our historic resource ordinance will help streamline and clarify the permit process to minimize delays in approving projects. We've also heard from applicants that having transparent historic design standards is critical to ensure consistency in the permitting process. The recently updated HRCI or Historic Resource Inventory includes recommendations for adding and removing properties from the inventory. These recommendations will be reviewed by the Historic Heritage Committee, the Planning Commission, and then to the City Council. This will include outreach and public meetings with the affected property owners. Finally, we will complete the long-awaited compliance review for our Mills Act contract properties, which has been delayed by COVID-19 restrictions. The city hired a consultant in 2019 to do the prep work for this work plan, and the committee looks forward to assisting in the project. This concludes the formal presentation. I would like to thank Cindy McCormick for helping prepare this PowerPoint. And she's available also if we have any other questions that I can't answer. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent report. Council members, any questions for Dave or for the committee? No. All right. Thank okay. you, Dave, very much. Thank you. Good job, neighbor. Okay. <laughs> through my window. Good job, neighbor. <laughs> oh, thanks. Okay, Thanks, thank you. All right, moving on then, um, item three, presentations to the council. Uh, this would be the time for anyone from the public who would like to um, speak to anything that is not on the agenda, but over which we have jurisdiction. Christina, do we have anyone who wants to speak? Yes, we have two. Um, first is Lauren, you may speak. Okay, Lauren, you have three minutes. Is is there a Lauren here? Hi, I'm sorry, I was muted. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, so my name is Lauren I'm Ellis. I'm a proud member of Gilroy. Thank you for letting me have this platform today. I'm gonna start by offering a very Happy and safe 4th of July to everyone and acknowledge that Gilroy first responders and we appreciate you and our community to keep us safe in efforts both seen and unseen. Last weekend on, July, on June 26th, the Gilroy Downtown Association hosted a great event for the revitalization efforts to bring Gilroy residents and non-locals together to celebrate the community and showcase the future possibilities for the area known as Gourmet Alley. The event was hosted in Gourmet Alley between 4th and 5th Street and supported by local businesses, which included food, wine, and beer vendors who were very excited to see a crowd assembled that was beyond what we expected. The event feedback was also very enthusiastic. The event was labeled Urban Eats on the Streets, simple, clean, and to the point. It was exciting to see our community come together and smile, dance, and see the progress made inside the alleyway. Sometimes I grow tired of driving 12 miles uh, up the road to Morgan Hill or 15 miles down the road to Hollister to enjoy the same luxuries we should have, I feel, in our town. The patronage only leads to support of their local economies and support for their police, fire, and public work sectors instead of helping our own. The city of Gilroy reaps, can reap astounding benefits by recognizing and sponsoring a large cooperative between the Business Association 
and the council or creating a strong alliance between all parties that can be recognized as added value to events and draw local destination seekers. I've been inv involved in events for the past 20 years, so I support anything positive regarding larger gatherings. Of course, this is post pandemic, of course, safety and securely. Events are structural part of human nature to gather and collaborate and meet your neighbors. It's a great time to address these issues and use this post pandemic momentum to our benefit collectively. Yes, our benefit. I do speak without complete political knowledge of the process and procedures required to support these functions respectfully. I'm asking the city to recognize these types of issues and that many of our residents see clearly that often we discuss these things in smaller groups, far less publicized than this. More cooperation is needed and we need our leaders to step up, join forces and put the red tape aside so that we can effectively grow our community. We have an incredible opportunity to make a difference for our residences, businesses and taxpayers. Our residents love Gilroy, they love Gilroy. Many people I meet while traveling the nation talk about Gilroy, of course, for the Garlic Festival, that's number one. They always say, we know you for garlic. Hey, Lauren, it's been three minutes. Would you like to wrap up? I would like to just, I would like to wrap up. I was, so with, so I'll just say, I ask humbly that you consider a more strategic partnership with other organizations to give people of Gilroy what they deserve. And I thank you for the opportunity to present this to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, Christina, do we have any other speakers? Yes, we have uh, Frida and then Bob. So that would be three. Okay, I, I'm. if you have a timer available, Christina, you're welcome to show people. Otherwise I'm, I'm timing here, but okay, go ahead, Frida. Hi, um, you got, uh, my name is Freda Hogan. I'm calling in because I was speaking with Fred Tovar and um, some people from the outreaches as well as Rebecca Armazeras um, and we had a pretty decent idea. We were thinking um, with the increase of unhomed families, if it would be possible to have them park at the um, elementary schools that have been closed down due to under enrollment. That way it would give them access to um, the playground and some place um, safe to park and um, something that would be kind of destigmatized. It's just a school. And as well as that, I was asking if it was possible to, um, uh, I obviously not this year because the pool is closed due to COVID, but you know, if we were allowed to have safe parking at one of the closed elementary schools, just for the unhoused families living in cars, just, just for that segment, it would be nice if we could um, bring out sprinklers for them too on the heat advisories. So I would really ask um, the council to uh, open up the parking lots that are not being used to allow families to um, sleep safely and let their kids use the lawns during the days. Um, it would be a great use of real estate and we'd be able to keep the kids safe and a little bit less um, hot this summer. So anyway. Thank, thank you, Fred. I, I want to point out that um, this is for matters that over which the city council has jurisdiction, and we do not have jurisdiction over school district property. That is the school board. So just wanting to make that clarification for you. Anything that's a schools is I, not, no, not I, something we can change. <laughs> I, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any other speakers? Yes, I think there was at least one more. Yes, um, Bob, let me go ahead and get him. Bob, you may speak. Thank you. Okay. Madam Mayor and Council, this is Bob Weaver. Paula and I had the, uh, the pleasure of attending the event on uh, Saturday night downtown. We saw a lot of old friends and we made some new friends. And I would like to say it was a wonderful experience and a kickoff for a program to revitalize downtown and hopefully we'll get this going. Now, I've, I've sensed that there's a malaise that's been hanging over the city for quite some time and we really need to break this malaise and get moving forward with some revitalization and economic development downtown. It is the heart 
of the of the city, and it what happens there pumps out through the community in so many different ways. But I will say that without some kind of positive action from the council and staff towards going forward with downtown revitalization and the Gourmet Alley project, you're essentially exporting economic development out of town to other communities who have taken the initiative to provide a place for their people to go and which we would have to go to get the same experience. So I don't want to feel that you're saying to the community that we are not worthy of a vibrant revitalized downtown. I believe you believe that we are worthy. I just think that you need to soften your hearts a bit and show some positive feelings about revitalization so that our economic development money will stay here from the people that come and participate in the Gourmet Alley type of events. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. All right, are there any other speakers? No, none. No. Okay, then that moves us on to item four, which is reports of council members. Uh, before we get started here, I would like to reiterate for all council members that uh, these are, if you're gonna report on any committee, it can only be on a committee on which this council has appointed you as the representative. What you do on your own time is up to you subject to the Brown Act, but reporting council member reports here on this dais to this council is for the council member that was appointed to that committee unless you attended as the alternate. Okay, so I'll start with council member Bracco. Nothing to report. Thank you. Council member Armendaris. There was no meetings for which I am the number one uh, delegate. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Council Member Marks. Yes, I have a couple of things. The Gilroy Gardens birthday party went off fabulously. They sold out both Friday and Saturday, so that's really good news. Um, I have to echo what our speakers said about the Gourmet Alley event. It was really fabulous to see the number of people that attended. Actually, one of the vendors just signed a lease today for one of the empty buildings because he was so impressed with uh, the the customer base, and he knew that he was going to do really well. So that's exciting. Uh, last night, the GDBA had a mixer, and the city of Gilroy won an award. I'd just like to read it to you real quickly. Uh, Downtown Gilroy Business Association is proud to recognize and thank the city of Gilroy for the facade program, patio furniture, and small business loans. I can tell the GDBA that we were all very um, happy to do that for you. And hopefully next year we can be saying thank you <laughs> for having PGE hooked up in some of those unused buildings and we can get that downtown revitalized. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Hilton. Thank you, Mayor Blankley. Um, I'd like to wish everyone a happy and safe 4th of July as well. Um, I'll provide more committee updates in August. And just a heads up to my council colleagues, staff, and the public that I'll be introducing a city code chapter 30 zoning ordinance performance standards noise amendment under future council initiated and agenda items in our August 2nd meeting. Thank you. All right, council member Tovar. Thank you, Mayor. No report tonight. Okay, council member Laromanos. Thank you, Mayor. Just two quick items. Uh, the Association of Bay Area Governments met last Friday. Uh, it was actually the 60th anniversary of ABAG, which as everyone knows is a regional effort that brings together local leaders from jur jurisdictions around the Bay Area to address regional issues, whether it's around homelessness, housing, uh, roads, et cetera. Uh, the items that we worked on in particular at this meeting was approving the budget for ABAG uh, it was a balanced budget that came uh, to us, but it was a budget that was reduced. Uh, last year, the budget for ABAG was $60 million. This year, it dropped down to $40 million. Um, and that's due to a wide variety of, uh, of factors, but that's just kind of the reality of where we're at as, a, uh, as, a, as an association. Uh, nonetheless, it was a balanced budget. And uh, we are looking forward to continuing to work on some of those regional issues going forward. 
The other item that I just wanted to put on people's radars is that I will be unavailable to attend the next meeting in August after our July break. Um, I will be unavailable for that, but I'll look forward to uh, to being at the all the meetings thereafter. All right, thank you. Um, I'm going to report on the Gilroy Youth Task Force. Council members Bracco and uh, the Roman Yost were also at that with me. That is an organization that we might be um, having a little more activity for, we'll see. Ever since the Santa Clara um, South County Youth Task Force was formed, um, much of the grant money was going to that organization for the benefit of South County as a whole, leaving Gilroy Youth Task Force uh, sort of um, not, not, not didn't have as much money to do programs with. So we've just kind of been holding our little pattern here and waiting for opportunity. We're gonna start fundraising again and hopefully have more money to give to youth programs. This is an organization that has existed since the early nineties. And I'd love to see that come back. Okay, future council initiated items, anything to raise here? Okay, consent calendar. Does anyone uh, have anything to remove from consent or do I have a motion? Motion to approve consent calendar. All right, thank you. Second, anyone? Second by council member Tovar. All right, we've got a motion by council member LaRoman Yo, seconded by council member Tovar to approve the consent calendar. Roll call vote, please. <coughs> council member Adam and Letty. You were muted, Rebecca, sorry. I asked you to mute when you're not talking and then I know. So, um, yes, my vote is yes. Councilmember Bracco? Yes. Councilmember Hilton? Aye. Councilmember Lero Munoz? Yes. Councilmember Marks? Yes. Councilmember Tovar? Yes. And Mayor Blankley? Yes. All right, that passes unanimously. All right, item 7A, bids and proposals. Authorize the city administrator to enter into a sole source purchase agreement for the replacement of Police Computer Aided Dispatch, CAD, and Records Management System, RMS, from Sunridge Systems, Inc. in the amount of $703,232. And Chief Espinoza is gonna give this report. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Council. With, uh, the item before you tonight is the replacement of our Records Management and Computer Aided Dispatch Systems. Both of these systems are critical and they're critical to our infrastructure and really for any public safety organization. Uh, both serve as core repositories for data related to calls for service, officer generated contact and enforcement, hazard or officer safety location concerns. Also for report writing, evidentiary chain of custody and the preparation of cases uh, to name a few. Our current system we purchased approximately 20 years ago. The company has been sold three times and, and really we haven't upgraded uh, our current software in 14 years, it's no longer supported. Uh, and the same with the CAT system, uh, we haven't uh, upgraded since 2016. They've reached the end of their life cycles and our, um, our provider is offering uh, really limited maintenance support at this point. Our current CAT RMS vendor, uh, our annual maintenance fee is approximately 160,000 per year and with a 5% uh, contracted increase every year. Current legislative uh, changes mandate that police departments transition uh, to a method by which statistical data is reported to state and federal agencies from uh, the old UCR, the Uniform Crime Reports, to the new uh, National Incident-Based Reporting System. Uh, these reporting requirements, uh, particularly at the federal level, became effective January 1st of 2021. And both our current systems uh, uh, do not have the cap capability to produce those numbers currently. Also with the passing of uh, the RIPA Act, the uh, Racial and Iden Identity Profiling Act, AB 953, it's gonna require us to start uh, uh, reporting these numbers effective January 1st, uh, 2022. Currently, we use several standalone softwares to accomplish uh, our, our daily efforts. Um, in November of 2020, staff formed a collaborative work group that uh, did some research and development. It really was, it was formed by the different disciplines within the organization, and they're all end users, and they evaluated uh, a couple of these uh, softwares, uh, four to be exact. The committee met several times and overall determined that Sunridge 
uh, by far provides the uh, most benefits. Sundridge is the largest CAT RMS system in Northern California, and they have approximately 180 agencies and growing. Um, uh, during the 30 year uh, uh, life of the company, none of these agencies have left for another vendor. All of the agencies are on the same uh, version of software and uh, all the feedback we've received has been positive. What's unique about this, uh, about Sunridge is that uh, they have the capability of um, information sharing with other agencies that are currently on the same system. And particularly in the county, we have approximately five agencies in Angroan. It gives us the opportunity to be an interoperable on the data sharing with our CAD and RMS system. And really that is what we're currently doing with the radio system. But now we don't have to physically call and receive information from these uh, agencies. And it also gives us the opportunity to extract data, uh, uh, particularly when, it, when we want to know uh, the approximate number of, of uh, unobligated hours that our officers have per shift and so that we could make uh, informed decisions based on that data. And so this is a budgeted item for fiscal year 22 uh, for IT. And um, it is a one-time uh, cost of, of, of $703 and $232, which includes the first year annual maintenance and the ongoing maintenance is 69,000 compared to the 160,000 that we currently pay. And uh, again, as part of the IT's operation, operating budget. Um, with the purchase of this software on an annual basis, we are looking to save approximately 94,000. Um, and the first year uh, savings will be approximately 159,000. We also pay about $4,000 to crimereports.com for data, and that will be included in, in this uh, software as well. So with that, I uh, will take any questions. Thank you, Chief. All right, uh, Council, I'll, yeah, I'll go to Council first and then I'll go to public comment. Council Member Bracco. Chief, uh, when will it be uh, implemented and be up and running? So we, we are um, optimistic and something like this typically takes six uh, months to a year, often 18 months, but we're really being optimistic and we're hoping to get it done six in the six to one year uh, um, area, six months to one year. Thank you. All right, council member Armendariz. Thank you uh, and thank you, chief. Um, Cause I have two questions. Number one, um, is this software not available or compatible software not available from any other company or why was it set uh, for a sole source? So the, the ability to be interoperable with uh, other agencies in the county is unique to this software. And also we have a standalone software that we currently use for our collision investigations. It's called Crossroads. And so this company also has that ability uh, to extract all, all the data and not have to duplicate the entries. No other vendor was able to do that as well. Okay, and then second question, um, does this software remove any barriers or delays in uh, records requests under uh, S, uh, SB 1421? I know uh, in prior requests, I've seen that there's delays because of the ability to redact um, software that couldn't redact, like it had to be hand redacted or some other pen, painstaking way to do it. So does this software um, comply with that? Yeah, there's, there's currently no software that would auto redact any uh, investigation to be uh, produced per 1421. The same thing for uh, the video. Uh, that is something separate in that sometimes if, if you don't have a third party vendor or a contractor, you really have to have someone to devote the staff hours to do that manually. So, so the, uh, the, the other, right. So the, the other angle on this software, and this, this is more on the transparency side, is that we're approaching the, the end of our life cycle for our body worn cameras. So we're we're looking to, to go to our third generation. So this has 
the most popular camera right now is Axon. So this has the ability uh, to auto populate those videos uh, when they are downloaded. So that is in preparation uh, for that future transition. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Tovar. Thank you, Mayor Chief. Thank you so much for this report. Um, I'm excited, especially um, about the, um, the mobile mapping software. It, you, it indicates that uh, it will prevent any delays, which is very important, especially for those 911 calls. Um, typically, off the top of your head or through your recollection, um, what is our current response time to a 911 call and how often do we have delays? And um, you know, will the software completely eliminate those delays? All right, so, it, so the response time all depends on how is prioritized. And you know, typically right. we try to respond to the priority one, which is an emergency uh, within five minutes. And so uh, sometimes it's difficult to extract the exact exact number. And we're hoping that the software, really what this mapping does, it pinpoints exactly. And it would send to, uh, to the terminal um, that information to the officer to follow and further right. uh, making those response times a lot shorter. Um, and so right now we use a Google map platform. And um, so we're hoping that this is going to to cut to some of that red tape and provide that information at a faster rate to the officers out on the field. You know, and I'm excited about that because as you know, I mean, uh, any delays can cost somebody their life. So I'm glad that we're- Absolutely. And, and, and the, you know, I didn't want to bore you with all the good, good things about the software, but it also is going to allow the officers to remain out of the field for an ex a lot more time because they're able to do everything from their mobile uh, CAD terminal particularly like report mm -hmm. writing. Yeah, nice, right. thank you. Okay, I'd like to go to the public. Uh, Christina, do we have anybody who would like to speak to this item? If you wish to speak on this item, please press star nine to unmute yourself or raise your hand at this time. Seeing none? No, okay. All right then, back to council. Is there uh, any more discussion or a motion? I'll move approval. I'll second. second. Okay, I saw some hands waving, but what I heard was Council Member Leroy Munoz moving approval, seconded by Council Member Mark. So are we okay with that? Yeah. Yes. Okay, to authorize the city administrator to enter into a sole source purchase agreement for the replacement of police computer aided dispatch and records management system from Sunridge Systems Inc. in the amount of $703,232. All right, roll call. Councilmember Armendariz? Yes. Councilmember Bracco? Yes. Councilmember Hilton? Aye. Councilmember Lerone Munoz? Yes. Councilmember Marks? Yes. Councilmember Tovar? Yes. And Mayor Blankley? Yes. All right, that brings us to item 7B, approval of agreements with CSG consultants and Forleaf in the amount of not to exceed $1,715,800 each and Bureau Veritas in the amount not to exceed $514,740 to provide on-call building and fire plan check and inspection services for the initial period of July 15th, 2021 to June 30th, 2024 with two one-year extensions possible. Robert Carrera, Manage Analyst, will be giving us this report. Hi, Robert. Hello, Mayor Blinkley. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Again, my name is Robert Carrera. I'm the Management Analyst for the Community Development Department. I will be giving this presentation on this item. I'll go ahead and there we go. So to consultants for uh, plan check and inspection services for the Building and Fire Prevention Division, they have become critical to uh, our permitting oper operations and in two unique ways. Number one, they help us meet our service level goals. And number two, they provide us with the needed expertise in our uh, develop in development. And the city has, provide has relied on these consultants now for years. At the beginning of this year, staff decided to conduct an RFP process to replenish these on-call consultants. So on May 7th, 2021, we issued 
uh, an RFP for these on-call services. And in total, we received six proposals. And with those six proposals, we had we assembled a, a, a team to rate the proposals. We conducted interviews with all of the uh, proposers and we conducted reference check for these pro uh, proposals. As a result from this evaluation process, we selected three consultants for to provide our these on-call services. CSP consultants and Four Leaf will be providing both on-call planning and inspection services for billing fire, while Beer Veritas will be providing plan check services only. The uh, agreements for CSG and Four Leaf will be contracts of a not to exceed amounts of one point, approximately one point seven million dollars, and that figure essentially represents our budget for on call uh, these on call services multiplied over a five year period. For Bureau Veritas, that amount, not that not to exceed amount, will total. Uh, oh, as you can see in the number right here, low over $500,000. And that number is approximately 30% of our on-call budget multiplied over five years. The reasoning behind these contract, contract capacities is it'll allow staff the flexibility to be able to utilize one, either of these consultants, one or the other, depending on what our workload demand is and what our resource needs are. So for example, if we needed to utilize CSP more for on-call for plan check services over uh, poorly for a certain fiscal year period, we would have the capacity to be able to encumber our budget uh, based on the, the a percentage amount that we were expected to use CSP more than four leaf and more than pure Veritas and so on and so forth. This would allow us the flexibility to be able to best utilize our resources to meet our uh, permitting and inspection needs. Uh, and just a reminder with these expenses, expenses incurred from these costs, they are full, fully recovered by uh, permanent inspection fees that are paid for the applicants. So you can't have an expenses occur on these contracts without them being uh, fully cost recovered through the payment of fees by our development applicants. So again, this allows us the flexibility to be able to encumber our budget, but never would our budget exceed that $343,000 amount for that has been budgeted to us for these on-call services. And then another item about evaluating performance of these uh, consultants. So these consultants will have an expectation to meet our service demands and be able to provide excellent customer service to our applicants, to our developers. Each of these contracts has terms of three years with two one-year options. And these one-year options are at the discretion of uh, the city to exercise whether or not we bl believe that they are um, performing well enough to continue these one year, have them continue with these one-year extensions. Uh, the city has established first and subsequent review targets for all various types of permits uh, where we, for different types of permits, we have an expectation of uh, this amount of working days when you would receive your first uh, plan permit review and we expect our consultants to be able to meet those working days and we communicate that with them. And Consultants, based on that information and meeting our resource and timeliness needs and expectations, this is what they will be evaluated upon. And based on what staff uh, gathers from their performance, especially initially over the three-year period, that uh, will determine whether or not they have been a sufficient partner in meeting our uh, expectations, uh, not just for us as a city, but also to our permitting customers as well. So with that, our recommendation is to approve agreements with CSG consultants and Forley in the amount not to exceed 1.7 uh, 
$1,015,800 each, and Vera Veritas an amount not to exceed $514,750 uh, to provide these on-call services for July 15th to June 30th of 2024, with two one-year extensions possible. And with that, that concludes my presentation. Myself and Director Gardner are here to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. All right, uh, council members, do you have any questions before I go to public comment? Okay, oh, council member Rocco? Yes, um, we recoup these costs from the developer, correct? We charge them and they, they pay us, so it's a wash? That is correct. I get it. Yeah, fully recoverable. Okay, um, do we have any people from, anybody from the public who is wanting to speak on this item? If you wish to speak on this item, please press star nine to unmute yourself or raise your hand at this time. Seeing none. All right, thank you. Okay, then that's back to council. Um, either additional questions or a motion would be where we are. No questions, I would move approval. All right. Okay. Uh, uh, move, moved by Council Member Laromagno, seconded by Council Member Bracco to approve agreements with CSG consultants and Four Leaf in the amount not to exceed one million seven fifteen eight hundred each, and Bureau of Veritas in the amount not to exceed five hundred fourteen thousand seven fifty to provide on-call building and fire plan check and inspection services for the initial period, July fifteenth, twenty twenty one to June 30th, 2024, with two one-year extensions possible and authorize the city administrator to execute these agreements. Roll call. Council Member Armandaris? Yes. Council Member Bracco? Yes. Council Member Hilton? Aye. Council Member Leroy Munoz? Yes. Council Member Marks? Yes. Council Member Tova? Yes. And Mayor Blinkley? Yes, it passes unanimously. All right, that brings us to item 8A, public hearings. Uh, consideration of the placement of special assessment liens for the non-payment of charges for the collection of garbage, rubbish, and refuse on certain properties located in the city of Gilroy. Uh, Harjot, you're giving this report, correct? That's correct. All um, right. All right, good evening, Mayor, council members, and community members that are listening in tonight. Uh, my name is Rajat Sung. I'm the city's finance director. Uh, the item before you is a public hearing item to consider the placement of special assessment liens for non-payment of garbage refuse bills uh, of properties located within the city of Gilroy. Uh, the city uh, contracts with Recology for garbage and refuse uh, services via an exclusive franchise agreement. Uh, this includes the billing and collection of payments for those services as well. Uh, annually, as with any other, every business, there are uh, accounts that go into uh, delinquency and uh, become subject to the special lien placement. The city's code uh, outlines the procedure for collection of the delinquent accounts via special lien process. The process includes uh, notification, which starts uh, much earlier in the year, and also includes an administrative hearing by the finance director. Uh, and ultimately, a final notice of the collection is issued to the customer as well as the property owner, uh, notifying them of the delinquency, the amount, and the last due date to uh, make that payment, as well as information about the city council public hearing. Uh, the list is generally longer, and the amounts are larger initially, and over the course of several months, uh, the account holders you know, make contact uh, with Recology and, and uh, bring the accounts current. Uh, the final list was published uh, and circulated this morning, which includes uh, about 147 accounts totaling about $35,000 and $872, uh, which includes the county's 1% admin fee. Um, I was uh, notified uh, since this morning there are about two accounts that uh, have made contact, so we would be removing those accounts as well uh, today. Um, and consistent with the City Council's annual practice, um, staff is recommending uh, that City Council adopt the resolution placing the uh, special assessment liens for the cost of the delinquent garbage and refuse accounts for those properties uh, in, in the City of Gilroy. That concludes my report. Um, I do have uh, Phil Couchet and Monica Estrada from Ecology uh, on the line as well, so three of us are available to answer any questions that you may have. Thank, Thank you. you. 
Thank you very much. Okay, council, um, anybody with questions? No. All right. Question. Oh, sorry. All right, council member Armendaris, you have a question? No, I said no questions. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, that would bring me then to public comment. Um, Christina, is there anybody who wants to speak on this item? If you wish to speak on this item, please press star nine uh, to unmute yourself or raise your hand at this time. See none. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm ready for a motion if there's someone out there who'd like to make one. I'll make a motion to approve. All right, motion by council member Bracco, seconded by? Second. All right, I saw Peter, but I'll give it to Fred. Fred, okay. Council member oh, Tovar, seconded. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> give it to the shorter guy, Peter. <laughs> Okay, uh, so anyway, motion to adopt a resolution of the City Council of the City of Gilroy imposing special assessment liens for the cost of delinquent garbage collection services for certain properties located in Gilroy, California. Roll call vote. Councilmember Armandaris? Yes. Councilmember Bracco? Yes. Councilmember Hilton? Aye. Councilmember Lero Munoz? Yes. Councilmember Marks? Yes. Councilmember Tovar? Yes. And Mayor Blankley. Yes, all right, that passes unanimously. Very good. That brings us to item B. This is introduction of an ordinance amending the city code to combine in one person the powers and duties of the city administrator and the city clerk. And this uh, is something we discussed in closed session before we went uh, this far. And Leanne McPhillips is going to give us the staff report. All right, Leanne. Good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council and Gilroy community. I'm going, to be, I'm going to be giving the presentation on this item tonight, and the City Attorney Andy Faber is also available to answer any legal questions the Council may have. I'm going to put up my PowerPoint, so give me one second. Okay, um, currently the city clerk position is vacant, as you all know, um, due to a retirement. Uh, so it was the best time for a review of a possible change related to this position. The city clerk position is a, currently a city council appointment. It is one of three positions that is directly appointed by the city council. The other two positions are the city attorney and the city administrator. The city clerk's uh, position uh, contains primarily administrative duties, um, and there are statute, statutory duties that are set by our city charter, and most of those must follow related laws. So there are laws and regulations on the books that dictate how those certain statutory duties must be completed. Other duties are set by the approved job description that's on the books with the city of Gilroy through um, the Human Resources Office and approved by the Personnel Commission. Uh, duties include agenda preparation and follow-up, records management, election coordination with the registrar of voters, and coordination of our city boards, commissions, and committees. What is, why is this coming before you? As, as the mayor just noted, the council requested this uh, position be reviewed. Um, a couple of the things that were highlighted were uh, looking for ease of supervision and day-to-day -day accountability. Uh, the council interaction with the city clerk on a regular day-to-day -day basis is limited, while the city administrator works with the city clerk very closely on, on matters on a day-to-day -day basis and interact with each other in the office day-to-day. -day. In addition, um, management uh, oversight uh, provides consistency with all the other managers within the city. Um, and the majority of the work performed falls under ad city administrator direction, such as preparing uh, meeting agendas and coordinating uh, and preparing for upcoming city council meetings. Uh, so having the leadership of the city administrator is important because the city administrator is the uh, position appointed by the council that is charged with implementing the council's work plan and the city's budget. So the question being reviewed is, can the offices of city administrator and city clerk be combined in one person? Um, so can the city administrator uh, also hold the office of city clerk? 
and then how, how the work would be performed and, and how the functions would be completed is there would be a management level position hired by the city administrator uh, to perform the work. And so that would be a professional manager um, with city clerk um, duties and experience in their background um, and likely certified as a uh, municipal clerk. So the, the question of compatibility of offices uh, was the question that the city attorney needed to review and complete a legal analysis on. Um, it's actually charter section 800, sorry for the typo, it's 800, uh, indicates that when the positions are not incompatible, the council may combine in one person the powers and duties of two offices. So that was the question uh, being reviewed by the city attorney. Um, and the offices can only be combined if they are in fact deemed to be compatible. And that falls under a, um, a legal analysis that our city attorney would love to discuss called the doctrine of incompatible offices. And so the charter does allow the combination if the offices are compatible. And as part of the review, the city attorney looked into um, recent case law, attorney general opinions, as well as a thorough review of our city charter. So um, some of the things that the analysis noted is the city clerk duties are largely ministerial. Uh, there was not a clash of duties identified um, when, when reviewing the duties of the city administrator and the city clerk. Um, the combination of offices is present in other agencies. Three examples of that include the cities of Santa Cruz, Santa Barbara, and Merced. And the uh, final legal conclusion is that the offices are compatible and may be combined in one person. One additional thing to note is in many general law cities, the city clerk is appointed by and reports to the city manager. Some additional points that the council um, might want to be uh, review and, and, and think about as, as you're considering this item is that there have been many law changes in the last 10 years. There have been updates to the Public Records Act which dictate how city records and information is shared with the, with the community. And Gilroy even went a step farther and adopted the Gilroy Open Government Ordinance. And we have a Gilroy Open Government Commission that uh, reviews um, information being provided to the public to ensure transparency and accountability. Many other agencies don't have such a commission, uh, Gilroy does. Another consideration is that elections are run uh, by the Santa Clara County Registrar of Voters. Um, we're, we're not directly running elections here in the city of Gilroy. Um, we're consolidating our elections with the Registrar of Voters um, through the county. Um, and that does require coordination by someone, but that, that can be any staff person that has the training and knowledge to be able to do that coordination. And any irregularities or protests related to an election are handled by the Registrar um, and or the Fair Political Practices Commission. And it's important to note that the city administrator cannot change statutory duties or direct any illegal or unethical acts. We have um, those kinds of situations through various positions in the city, um, such as, um, so it includes the statutory duties of the city clerk, which follow laws and regulations that have to be complied with. Um, another example is in the finance department, the city is required to put together an audit and a CAFR report every year that is done under the direction of the, of the finance director, director and the city administrator cannot uh, change the, the documents or the numbers or any of the information contained in the CAFR report. Um, there are maps and, and other engineering documents that are managed by the public works director or the city engineer. And that person, you know, those folks report up through the city administrator, but the city administrator does not have a role in um, dictating what appears on those maps that is handled by those professional staff in, in the office. And then if there were a complaint of harassment or discrimination that needed to be investigated, that falls under the purview of the human resources director um, and the city administrator couldn't interfere in that kind of, of, of uh, investigation or process. So just some other examples of how duties flow within the city organization. So the proposed change, pro the proposed change involves combining these offices so the city administrator would also be the city clerk. 
we would hire a full-time council services and records manager to perform the day-to-day -day work, be a professional uh, individual with related experience and certifications, as I mentioned. The council services and records manager would report to the city administrator versus the city council. Um, the council services and records manager would be the liaison to the open government commission um, that that work would continue and that involves a lot of the records of the city and how we're making uh, information and records um, available and transparent to the community. And the council services and records manager would have access to the city council, the city attorney or the HR director if there were ever any irregularities or concerns. So the recommendation and next steps um, would be if the council wishes to move this forward, um, then the recommendation is to introduce an ordinance allowing the combination of the duties of the city clerk and the city administrator in one person to be effectuated by a future resolution of the city council. Uh, the ordinance and the resolution are attached to the staff report for your reference. And if approved tonight by council, then the second reading of the ordinance and the adoption of the resolution would be scheduled for August 2nd uh, meeting. And then staff would work to prepare the council services and records manager job description and take that to the personnel commission for approval. And that would allow us to begin the recruitment process to fill that vacant position. And then the higher date for the council services and records manager would follow the final effective date of the ordinance, um, which, which would be September 1st, if the uh, second reading was completed on August 2nd, 2021. So the city attorney and I are happy to answer any questions that council may have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leanne. Before I go to council members, I'd, I'd like to give my own take on this too, and it might result in some questions too. But I would like um, not just council members, but the public to understand that what we're asking for, to, that the city clerk position, first of all, in our city charter is not changing at all. Charter doesn't change. This is an ordinance that we're suggesting to change what is currently a job that reports most of its duties to the city administrator already. And just the certain things that we call the statutory portion to city council. And those are things like elections and uh, the records and, and things of that nature. That distinction between what's already reportable to the city administrator versus the portion of the city clerk's job that so far has been directly to city council has been the subject of such confusion even within our city clerk and our city city hall and city attorney that Andy back in 2012 had to write quite a lengthy document to explain to our city clerk what those differences were. So I will be asking Andy to speak to that too, but I want the public to understand kind of why we're here. We as council members, with the exception of myself, nobody has an office at city hall. We don't work daily at city hall. So we can't be there to manage the things that the city clerk does, but we certainly want to maintain uh, the independence, you know, and the integrity of things like our elections. So the way we're, we're suggesting going about this is to adopt an ordinance that really comes in the form of a resolution after tonight. If we went forward with the ordinance, then the resolution comes at the next meeting, which is in that resolution would say that we've adopted this ordinance. And that resolution should, should something down the road that we cannot foresee uh, uh, come up to the to our detriment that we decide this just isn't for, for whatever reason we un, we can undo it and the charter and, and everything else stays just like it is today so we're not doing anything permanent we're just trying a way of avoiding that confusion when we have a city clerk who now we're suggesting calling a council services and records manager to make that person clearly accountable to the city administrator for the day-to-day -day operations of that person's job. Um, my suggestion might be that we direct staff to draft a job description that would come back to us, that would specify in the job description the things that are of concern to us, such as making sure we get a report directly on public records requests or on logs of complaints for elections or on anything else that the council might want to hear directly from. So I'm gonna stop there and go to council members and then we'll go to public comment and then come back 
uh, to council members. So I see council member Tovar with a hand and then I see council member Laromenos with a hand. Okay, council member thank Tovar. You, yeah, thank you, Mayor. Thank you for that. For, the, for those comments, I appreciate our conversation we had. Um, and I've been on the fence with this, just sort of thinking this through. And I guess one of the main questions I have, and maybe this is for Andy. Andy, in regards um, to sort of the, the change in this position, um, my concern, my biggest concern is in which has been mentioned many times, the city clerk has always reported directly to city council. Okay. Only this for certain sort of things. That, okay. Right. Only, Only for, for certain things, right, right. right. That has not been the case, okay. Let, let me finish, please. Yes, no, I agree with you. I'm not disagreeing with that, but I'm just saying we now will lose complete control over that because now the city clerk is now the city administrator. Um, and so the position has been changed quite a bit, but I just, my question is, first of all, my first comment is I think, and I am a lot to blame as well because I, I've been on the city council for many years. I think that we didn't do a good enough job overseeing um, our city clerk's daily responsibilities and sort of uh, objectives and goals and expectations. And I think that, you know, uh, we are part to blame for that in the past. But when I look at this, I ask the question is, could not uh, the city clerk uh, report directly to city council, but yet is supervised by the city administrator? I guess that question is for Andy or for Leanne. Yeah, well, uh, let me take a stab at it because I, I would say to a large extent that is what happens now. The city right. clerk, the, the, the question of the division of job responsibilities between city clerk and city administrator has been confusing for many years. And as the mayor mentioned, we were asked nine years ago to draft a memorandum essentially because there was a, I guess you call it a turf war going on between the then city manager, city administrator, and the then city clerk. And so we did that. Um, under the charter, the city council appoints and removes the city clerk. However, under the charter, the city council doesn't really supervise the city clerk, actually. And in fact, the uh, ordinance that we have uh, that was adopted at the same time the charter was adopted back in 1960. Right. says that the office shall be under the direct control of the city clerk as to statutory duties, but subject to the general administrative direction of the city administrator. And so the city clerk, by, by description in the charter, as well as by state law, attends council meetings, keeps records, keeps books of contracts, ordinances, resolutions, and so on. And as the election officer, is the election officer, and she, he, he or she, and also worries um, about public transparency of documents as a, under the PRA. And as we have added, the, the city has added also is a liaison with the OGO commission. Um, but in terms of reporting to the council, there's very little that's directly from the city clerk, mostly concerning elections uh, where the city clerk is tasked, although the elections are run by the county, the city clerk is tasked with worrying about the timelines and making sure that documents get in on time because there are all these very complicated technical rules about elections. But uh, in terms of actually reporting to the council, there's very little that the city clerk has been doing. However, if the council would like to specify particular kinds of reporting, you could certainly do that. And that could be part of the job description. It doesn't have to be the ordinance. The ordinance is very simple and simply gives authorization to the council itself to combine the offices uh, or the powers and duties of the two offices in one person. It doesn't get rid of the office in any way or change it. It just says that one person can technically be both. Right. So whatever kind of reporting no, you feel is appropriate can right. be maintained. Now, Andy, you know, and that's sort of what I was aiming for to hear from you in regards to, again, what can city council request in regards to reporting directly to city council and in, you know, in, in this discussion, we hear about past practice or there was um, changes that were made or needed to be made because of uh, it not going as smoothly as should have gone. I just, my only concern is if we pulled completely away and it's through the city manager or city administrator, then we're getting second or third hand information later on. And, uh, you know, the way I saw it now is if we needed something from the city clerk, 
they would report directly to us. We'd get that from the city clerk. What's to say later on um, that this may not be an issue where now we're feeling that we're not getting accurate information. Does that question make sense? Yes, and you know, things like that can occur, clearly. I mean, right. there can be issues that arise in the future. On the other hand, we have also, uh, the, the, we're, not, we're not taking a position that the council should or should not do this, but we're saying it's right. legal to do it. And the proposed approach that we outlined is to change the ordinance, but then actually do it by resolution, which can be undone at any time. So it may be that certain city administrators don't have the right personality or don't want to do the job, or maybe that's not their strong suit. And the council might feel that uh, a modification should be made. And the reason for doing it for, by resolution is because it's very easy to change a resolution, just adopt another one. We didn't want to bake it into the ordinance that this has to be done. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Okay. Those are my questions. Thank you. Right now. All right. Council Member LaRoman Yost, followed by Council Member Marks. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, so, my question, uh, both for you and for Andy, as I'm trying to understand this, one is uh, it's a series of questions, actually. The first is as this is, as we are contemplating this now, um, although the city clerk and the city administrator's office could be combined, we're still thinking about getting a separate person. So it wouldn't be Jimmy per se, a city administrator taking over that role, him personally, but another person independently taking on that role. So that's that's my first question and you're nodding. So I think I- No, no, I I'm not I, nodding. I, I'm shaking my head. No, oh, I okay. Well, I, I was looking at uh, the mayor and Leanne, but Andy, if you're going the other yeah. way, please. I, I, I'm shaking my head in a technical way, council member Leroy Munoz, because we're not eliminating the office. We're not combining two offices. There's still a city clerk's office. There's still a city administrator's office. We're saying that one person who can be the city administrator will hold both offices. Right. In the cities that do this, they then appoint essentially a deputy city administrator who is the de facto city clerk and does the city clerk work. And I think Leanne put that up on one of her slides. That records manager person is really the one who has the city clerk training and background and certifications. And the outside world essentially looks to that person as being the person running the clerk's office. We're not eliminating the office of city clerk and we're not combining it because we, we can't do that under the charter. Okay. You meant to say deputy city clerk, not deputy city administrator. Oh, okay. I, I, I think I'm getting it, but I think the fact that I'm yes, I think you're right, still yeah. struggling with it suggests that other people might also be str struggling with it. My yeah. second mm -hmm. question or, or thought on this is, uh, uh, Madam Mayor, I think you might have suggested this with regard to certain responsibilities that are still reported to city council and they're in particular the elections uh, uh, responsibilities. You highlighted that. We know how important that is in terms of avoiding even the appearance of impropriety or somebody consolidating power. And I'm not suggesting that's, that's been the case. I'm not suggesting that will be the case, but just avoiding that appearance. Uh, Madam Mayor or, or Andy, could you speak to what that would look like if we were to kind of still preserve those election duties as being reportable to the, uh, the city council? I think you could do that. Um, we have, I, I, I would say that we have not heard in talking to these other cities that there's ever been an issue. And as an example, my, my partner, Jolie Houston, whom I think you all know, Yep. Uh, was the interim city attorney of Merced for several years. They hired her for three months and it, <laughs> it, it, it dragged on for a number of years, including going through an election cycle. And she reported there was simply no issue at all. Santa Cruz apparently has not had issues. I've talked to the city attorney. They've had the situation for 11 years. So uh, I think if the council wants some kind of election reporting directly to them, that would be appropriate. We have to sort of define what that would be. We don't have to define that in this ordinance, certainly, and I wouldn't want to put it in the ordinance, but it can be defined in the job description or even in the resolution that makes the change that could be adopted later. Okay, Th that, those are all the questions I have at the moment. Thank you. Thanks, Council Member. Yeah, that, was, I, what, that is what I was alluding to before is that those kinds of things, we ask staff to come back to us with the job description that would make us comfortable to make sure that the integrity of these things are still preserved and that these would be direct reports uh, 
reportable items directly to the council. It doesn't have to go through the city administrator if that's what makes us feel more comfortable. But it is um, interesting to note that such issues just have not been the case in the past. Um, for whatever reason, I imagine it's because you've got the FPPC and the Register of Voters that are actually controlling these things. And I don't know how any city administrator would be able to infiltrate that any more than he could tell our finance director not to disclose something that general accepted accounting principles require be disclosed. Mm -hmm. or, so that it's the city that, clerk, or that a separate city clerk could do. It, exactly. Yeah. And, I mean, really to think about it in terms of how how it's being discussed here is, is something that you know could be done now. It's, it's illegal. An illegal act can happen anytime and that, that would be illegal. So anyway, that's how I see that. Council Member Marks, you had your hand raised. And then I believe it was Council Member Hilton before Council Member Bracco. Uh, yes, I just have a couple of concerns about combining these two positions. Um, number one, I mean, I've heard where there were problems, you know, back in 2012 and, and the role of the city clerk was confused. And in my mind, I'm saying, wh why would it be confused? whose responsibility was it to outline real specifically the definition of both positions and, and what their duties were and why in the past didn't the city council get more involved if there was a conflict going on. I also worry about in the future if Gilroy, you know, Gilroy could have a city manager that would be very controlling. And this manager managing city clerk, so to speak, is under him. And yes, I, I know it's been said that we can undo the resolution. I know it's been said that uh, the person could go to HR and talk about you know anything, any wrongdoing that was happening, but it's really hard to turn in your boss if there's threats of being fired and your job is on the line. Um, those are my two concerns. I know I've heard from different people in the public that have similar concerns. I hope they call in tonight because I really want to have a hearty discussion on this and listen, you know, to what everyone has to say. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Andy, to the yes, I was just going to say, would you please respond to why it was so <laughs> that 2020? You should have read that report, Carol, to know why that well, was I so think, difficult. I think what happened was fairly straightforward. It was a matter of personalities of the people involved, specifically. It's something that built up over time, over several years. After we wrote the memo, the council did, in fact, jump in and did um, deal with this in closed sessions, dealing with the two individuals involved. Uh, in their evaluations. And so the council essentially did take control of and, and quite achieve a sort of modus operandi, a, a, way, a way that the two offices could get along. But it becomes, some of these things become personality issues sometimes among individuals, as I'm sure the council can appreciate. Okay, thank you. Council member Hilton. Thank you, Mayor. Um, my, my question, uh, probably to Leanne, would this be, um, a union like position for under a manager or are they still an at will like director spot? Sorry, I had myself muted there. Um, it, it could be set up either way. It could be set up as a as an at will position that um, serves at the will and pleasure of the city administrator, or it could be set up as a manager that's a part of the Gilroy Management Association. I think that is a decision that that we can make and establish as part of the job description uh, by identifying uh, the role and responsibility of the position. Typically, um, typically a position, I mean, to make a position, quote, confidential, unrepresented, it, it has to link into the to the labor relations duties, but to make it, um, you know, similar to structure, like we have with our department heads, where we're, we are all at will, and we serve at the will and pleasure of the city administrator, it could be set up either way. Um, th th that would be my, that would be my choice to have it that way, set up as a director spot, because I think that would alleviate some of the issues that if there are conflicts or if the, if this office is not being held to the high standards that we would want, um, it's a lot harder to uh, um, resolve that without having that person at will. And I too would like to see the job description. Um, uh, being a newly elected, the city clerk's office was, was hugely important 
uh, roadmap, the only person that I talk to um, to get me through it. So I want to make sure that, that that continues through. Thank you. Yes, that, that type of liaison work would continue with uh, the person who serves in the capacity of the council services and records manager. And I might add, uh, under the charter, if the person were treated as a department head, they would be an officer, of course, and they, department heads cannot be appointed or removed by the city administrator without the council consent. Yeah, I think that's huge to have that in there. I hope everyone agrees with that. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you for that question and, th and thank you for the answer. All right, uh, Council Member Bracco. Yes, um, I don't really have a question, but in, in my time on this council, I've served with two different city clerks and we only had this issue for a brief time. Um, and it was probably as much one's fault as the other. And I, I, I think we could have handled it differently, and, but we did handle it. Um, but in all the years I've been on council, we had this one issue. I don't think that's enough to make a change. There's a reason things are separated. Um, and uh, my time on the council, we've had quite a few city managers. And you know, a lot of times it's really hard to get any information out of a city manager. They just don't tell the council. And I, I'm concerned about that because Shauna would give us a heads up when she got an open government uh, a public records request for something she knew was going to be controversial, she'd make sure we knew about it. And um, I, I don't want to lose that. So I, I'm against this. And um, I, I would urge my colleagues to, I mean, I don't really don't see a, a, a need to change. And, and a red flag for me is you don't hear people stepping up and saying, give me some more responsibilities you know, that, that just throws up a red flag for me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I've got something to, to say to that, Dion, just because my experience has been different, but I think I'll go to uh, public comment first since I already spoke and then we'll come back uh, to council. So are there um, any the, public comments? You can oh, open the public hearing. This is a public hearing actually. Okay, I'm opening the public hearing. So do we have any members of the public who wish to speak at the public hearing? If you wish to speak on this item, please press star nine to unmute yourself or raise your hand at this time. All right, I have a phone number 408-427-1546, you may speak. And can we, thank you for the timer, okay. Hello? Yes. Hello, can you hear me? You're on, Kat. Hi, this is Kat Tucker. And I um, actually, I just heard what Councilmember Bracco said, and I completely agree with him. I don't, I don't know what's driving this change other than maybe some mismanagement of an employee. And I would take part of the blame myself for some of that mismanagement. But my understanding is the issue was settled. And if there has been recent issues, why didn't staff come to us? I would ask um, the city manager, why didn't he come to us? Or in the past, if this was really becoming critical point where you have to make this change. I don't, I don't agree at all in this change. There was a reason why it was separated out because of course years ago, once upon a time it was under one person and then now it's not. And other than the one item that Andy spoke to, um, I, I agree that a lot of effort was put back then and it was cleared up. So even if you had, you know, an interaction with the, uh, the previous city clerk that you were unhappy with, then why wasn't it raised? Why wasn't it brought up into, under performance evaluation? Because the performance evaluations all were excellent. So it makes a red flag to me as well. I'm wondering what's really driving this. And so, uh, as you know, I've already sent an email saying I'm against this, but those are my two cents. There's a lot, there's a lot of history behind here and I just don't think it's necessary to be 
making a change when it's not needed. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have another speaker? Seeing none. Oh, all right. I was expecting more. Okay, then um, this comes back to council. I'm, I'm gonna, like I said, try to take a stab. We'll, let all, we'll do another round with all of council if you want. Um, but it's just, it's easier. Some things are easier said than done, I guess is what, what I'll say. Uh, we have had issues uh, more than just what was back in 2012. And um, it's something that can be addressed in that most, most of the duties of the city clerk are employee of nature and already report to the city administrator. Not a confusing thing at all. But when you have that, when you're in that position of some things are to city administrator, some things are direct to council and you don't have a city with council who is present day to day, it just creates the possibility of a position that ends up not reporting to anybody because one, because that person can say, well, I don't report to you for that, I report to them. But then to me as the new mayor, I can get the same comment. Well, no, I don't, that's not something I report to you on. This was just something that I think would have, would, if the council entertains it, would make things easier. And Andy has suggested it in a way that makes it very easy to, there's nothing permanent about it. It's, it's much easier to, to undo the resolution next year than it is to sit down and have all these meetings and deal with, with someone who's not doing their job and reporting to the right entity. Um, I don't know what more to say about that, except that I think the answers are all in the job description, that that's what we have staff come back to us with, with the job description, because most of us look to the city administrator anyway. When we would get an email from the city clerk telling us that she's going to be on vacation next week, what are we doing with that information other than going to the city clerk and saying, how is that being covered? That is just, that is a an operation that we look to our city administrator for anyway. And that's how a lot of things come about. That's how we ended up uh, agreeing the then council to uh, remove the funding we were giving to the then EDC person because we end up looking at our city administrator anyway for things that, that aren't happening. So that's probably all I need to, uh, I'm gonna say on that subject, um, Andy's the best person to have answered the questions that we have. Um, I would like to see us give this a try because I've been on this council since the beginning of 2018 and it has not been smooth. For me, it has not been smooth at all. So to those who aren't there watching it, you know, maybe it feels like nothing has come up, but things have. And I, I would like to see us give this a try. Do any other council members have any other comments? Council member Hilton, you're on mute. You're on mute. Thank you. you um, I too support this. Um, and of the things you said, and I think that it can be managed as long as this person is in a director position and not will employ. Um, and just like the mayor said, uh, there's many things that we would go to the city administrator majority of time anyways, but if the performance of that, of this office is not what we hold it to, we, the person accountable would be the city administrator and they are not will employ. And, um, and they have their own performance too. So I, I'm, I'm happy to support this tonight. As, but the main, main thing is that I wanna see that job description too, Absolutely. but how can we assure that if we're all in agreement of that, how can we assure that we see the job description and that they are that director spot? That, that's the part where I'm a little confused. Thank you. Okay, uh, council member Marks. If we have a really good job description, and we hold that person accountable, I still don't see the need to separate or to combine these two positions into one because it would be the same thing. If the person wasn't meeting the job descri description requirements, then that person would be taken to task. That's all. Thank you. Council Member Tovar. Thank you, Mary. Yeah, I, and I was one that was very vocal that we needed change. Um, but I'm also going to agree that I think with a solid job description that we can avoid the issues that we've had in the past. You know, I've been thinking about sort of my take on all this for quite some time. Um, and I'm leaning against sort of this creation of um, this, this 
new position per se, but the end question for you, um, of all the cities, how many have exactly what we're trying to do here today, have set up this way? I don't know exactly how, how many throughout you know, the state of California. We identified several examples. The city of Santa Cruz, for example, um, is this city of Santa Cruz has a charter that's the you know, same as, you know, basically the same as, as Gilroy's charter. Um, and they experienced um, you know, some similar challenges, but also they were trying to um, consolidate and, and, and save some resources. And so that um, happened, at, I think, right around the Great Recession time, and they consolidated the two positions there. And it's been in place for the last 11 years, for example, and uh, the position they, they have there, the separate position they have. So the city manager there is the city clerk, and then there's a position called city clerk administrator that's hired by the city administrator who performs the day-to-day -day work. And then uh, city attorney Faber spoke with the city attorney in Santa Cruz um, and confirmed the structure and confirmed there was no issues. And then, you know, uh, Andy talked about um, Merced where Julie Houston worked. Um, and, and, you know, charter cities are set up a little bit different than general law cities. And many of the general law cities, the city clerk is a uh, position that's hired by this uh, by the city manager. There are also some places where the city clerk is elected. So there are some different models out there. Um, I don't know if Annie wants to add anything else to that. No, no, no I don't. Uh, yeah, the city of Santa Clara has an elected city clerk and an elected police chief, for example, which is another way. They're a charter city, of course, as well. But that's another way of doing things where not recommending that. Right. Right. I didn't, let me go back to my original comments and what I mentioned in the beginning was my whole take on this in the very beginning is that we would have somebody that would uh, be supervised by our city administrator, but would be overseen by city council and reported to city council. Um, that's sort of where I was initial in favor of, but this is a little bit quite different than what I had hoped. So um, right now I, I would have to vote against this. Thank you. Okay, Council Member LaRoman Yost. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yeah, I'm, I'm still trying to wrap my brain around, you know, which, which responsibilities versus which responsibilities are reportable to us and which are not. Uh, you know, for me, as I kind of think through this, again, I, I, repeating a comment I made earlier, I, I, if I'm having, you know, issues trying to understand the contours of the role, I'm, I'm, I can imagine that others in the public and within our community are as well. Um, but I did want to go back to one other issue uh, that I had brought up earlier, and that was again around kind of the, the carving out of the election responsibilities. Yeah, Mayor, I believe you had mentioned that that was something that was going to be done in the job description, but is that also possible to put in the resolution itself, just so we make sure that? I, I, don't, know, I don't know if that is or not. All right, uh, Andy or Leanne, can you speak to that? Because I would certainly be happy to, I would not have a problem with that. Yeah, I, 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 as I, I think I mentioned earlier, I think we could do that if that was, if that was the council's desire, yes. Yeah. Okay, so before, just to be clear, before us tonight is not that resolution, before us tonight is the ordinance. So then we would be giving direction to staff when they come back to us with the resolution, that the resolution be clear that uh, however, it's going to. However, we're going to go with that discussion. That it be that election duties alone be uh, directly reported to City Council, right? Is that what we're saying, Leanne? Yes. Tonight, tonight is just the introduction of the ordinance, and then the details that you may wish to put in the resolution would be brought back at the August second meeting. Well, and, and also at the August second meeting, the the ordinance would be brought back for adoption. So I mean, you introduce if you if if you if you approve the ordinance now, you're introducing it. You still would have to adopt it before it becomes effective. So that's another discretionary decision that would be in front of you then on August second. And and, and Leon and Andy, uh, you you might be positioned to answer this. You know, it sounds like a lot of the concern around this. Um, is really about the logistics of who oversees kind of the day-to-day -day, given the fact that council is is not present that it's a part-time role we all have you know other other jobs that we do during the, during the business hours is it are the logistics of who oversees those day-to-day -day responsibilities of the 
of the city clerk, would it be possible to articulate those simply in a job description or would we need a more formal resolution in order to do that? I think it's the report, it's, it's the official reporting structure of it's the, the structure program. itself and, and not, the, and, you know. and anyone who has more than, you know, you know, one master per se, you yeah. know, it, you know, it, it can get confusing and, and, and who's, you know, whose direction do they follow? And with a lot of the duties, there is the overlap of, of the, you know, the main thing that we do on a regular basis at the city, which is uh, bringing forward, uh, you know, the, the work plan that the council has set forth as, as part of the uh, budget and, and the whole process and, and the council meetings and how those things are prioritized and brought to the council. It takes the whole team to make that happen. And we're all functioning under the, the direction of our city administrator, uh, who's ultimately responsible to answer to the council for those items. Um, and, and it's important then that the team that's supporting those efforts uh, have that accountability structure to the city administrator so that the city administrator can get the business of the city done uh, efficiently and effectively. Um, and, and I think that if there are specific things you want to include in the resolution, that would be fine. And if there's specific things you want to include in the job description, that's fine. Because I think there could be specific duties uh, included in the job description for specific reporting to the city council on specific items. You know, the council services and records manager will independently prepare a, you know, a report on the city election to the city council. Um, you know, that could be a duty in the job description called out that specifically. All right. Council member of the Roman Yost, is that good? Okay, Council Member Armandaris, I think you were next. And then, okay, Council Member Armandaris. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I feel like um, the language in the charter, of course, is ambiguous and it's led to, you know, this um, trying uh, challenges and difficulties in, in administering the, the position. And so I feel like um, I'm open to trying this. I'm gonna support the resolution. Um, but like um, others before me have said, I think we have to have really clear uh, job description and job duties laid out that delineate the line of, of reporting and what specifically is um, is reported to whom. And also we have to be careful with the um, job duties of um, uh, as they relate to campaigns, because although it's um, because it's a non-political political position, right? So we don't want them to be subject to politics as they deal with, with campaigns and candidates. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So would someone like to take a stab at, at a motion? Um, maybe I will, because I, I would really like to see us try this. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna make the motion and, and see if there's a second. And that motion is going to be to introduce an ordinance. This is just for the ordinance. So the resolution and the job description stuff is later. Ordinance of the City Council of the City of Gilroy amending Chapter 2 of the Gilroy City Code to authorize the City Council to combine in one person the powers and duties of the offices of City Administrator and City Clerk. Is there a second to that I'll motion? I'll second. I'll second you, Mayor. Okay, so we have a motion by me and seconded by Council Member Hilton. Um, it's, I don't know that we need to do any more discussion. We should probably do a roll call vote here and then, uh, right? Everybody, okay, yeah. Uh, Christina, let's go ahead and do a do a roll call vote uh, with that. Councilmember Armandaris, yes. Councilmember Bracco, no. Councilmember Hilton, aye. Councilmember Lara Munoz, no. Councilmember Marks, no. Councilmember Tovar, no. And Member Blake Blankley, uh, yes. Okay, so that. Uh, fails three to three to or fails four to three, I guess is the way you say it. All right, so that's it, right? We don't, there's no other motion to make it just, it fails. So things stay as they are. Is there anything else to do at this point? Uh, no, not, not, not in connection with this item, the motion has failed. So yes, we, right. simply, we simply move on at this point. We simply move on. Okay, we are moving on. 
So on to item nine, unfinished business. A, adopt an ordinance of the city council of the city of Gilroy, amending the Gilroy city code chapter 30, article 34, fences and obstructions, to allow monitored perimeter security fence systems on commercial and industrial zone properties subject to specified criteria in the ordinance. And this will be Cindy, right? Cindy giving the report? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Good evening. On June 21st, the council introduced an ordinance to amend the Gilroy City Code to allow monitored perimeter security fence systems on commercial and industrial zone properties. No modifications to the draft ordinance were proposed by the council. Council is now asked to adopt the ordinance consistent with its June 21st action. The ordinance would take effect 30 days from the date of council action. This concludes my report. Well, all right, council, any questions? No questions, I'll move approval. Okay, except I gotta go to public comment first. Uh, do we have anybody from the public who would like to speak on this item? If you wish to speak on this item, please press star nine to unmute yourself or raise your hand at this time. Seeing none. Okay. Um, I think we are ready to make a motion. So I, I see some, yeah. Why don't go ahead. Council Member Laura Munoz, you want to go ahead with your motion? Yeah, I was just going to move approval of that. Okay. Is there a second? Second. All right, moved by Council Member Laura Munoz, seconded by Council Member Marks to adopt uh, the ordinance of the City Council of the City of Gilray amending the code, Chapter 30, Article 34, to allow monitored perimeter security fence systems on commercial and industrial zone properties subject to specified criteria in the ordinance. Roll call vote. Council Member Armandaris? Yes. Council Member Bracco? Yes. Council Member Hilton? Aye. Council Member Laura Munoz? Yes. Council Member Marks? Yes. Council Member Tovar? Yes. And Mayor Blankey? Yes, passes unanimously. All right, item B, resolution granting an exemption from the 60 day length of stay requirement contained in CUP 00 10 for the Garlic Farm RV Park special occupancy use. And is it Karen giving the report on this one? Or Cindy? I'll, I'll give the report, Mayor. Cindy, okay, sorry. No worries. Following the May 10th City Council study session where Harmony Communities provided the council with information regarding their recent purchase and use of the Garlic Farm RV Park, staff has returned with a draft resolution recommending an exemption to the 60-day maximum stay condition that was part of the park's 2000 approval of a conditional use permit. One other notable condition in the CUP is the provision that the city may request periodic hearings and visitor records regarding RV park operations. During the May 10th meeting, Harmony Community stated that there is zero demand for overnight stays and that there is no impact to the Gilroy School District because school aged children in the Garlic Farm RV park are already attending Gilroy schools. Harmony Communities also stated that the RV park is providing affordable housing for very low income residents making 30 to 50% of area median income for Santa Clara County. Following the meeting, staff reached out to the school district, the Gilroy Visitor Center and Christopher Farms to see if there were any of these entities had any concerns about the requested exemption. No concerns were raised and based on Harmony Communities testimony, staff has made the required findings to grant the exemption as provided in the resolution attached to your packet. I would also like to note for the record that RV parks are considered special occupancy parks pursuant to state law and are by city definition, temporary living quarters. Therefore, the garlic farm RV park is not considered a residential use for the purpose of the general plans prohibition against residential uses east of highway 101. Furthermore, the tiny homes located within the park shall conform to the state standards for park trailers consistent with the California Health and Safety Code, including being 400 or square feet or less in floor area, less than or equal to 14 feet wide, and built on a single chassis. This concludes my report. Please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you, Cindy. Um, yeah, can, right, thank you very much. Okay, so I'd, I have one question. Since this, since 
the um, since this is filling a need with very low income housing, and that's one of the points that's being pointed out, you know, in all of this, in, in what we're trying to do here, is it possible? Is it possible to make as a condition um, something that would make sure that it continues to be uh, something for very low income, or is that not a condition that we can attach? The only way to guarantee uh, a, a particular rent or sales price is to do a deed restriction. Um, and we would need to make some findings uh, with a nexus tied to this request to do that. Okay, I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. All right, I don't know who whose hand was first. Council Member Bracco. Okay, Council Member Bracco. I don't think we would need to make any kind of uh, deed restriction. Just the fact that they're 400 squ uh, square foot is going to dictate a low price. You know, they're not going to be $300,000. You know, they're, they're going to stay pretty reasonable. If I may, in the, um, in the resolution, I think we call them affordable by design, which is saying the same thing as Council Member Bracco essentially said. <laughs> Yeah, I was just trying to distinguish between affordable and very low income, because very, very low income affordability is something we can certainly use here in Gilroy. And I was wondering if there was a way, you know, without, we're not talking rent control, things like that, but just something that would make it so that this has to fill that, continue to fill that need into the future. If we're granting this, that was my question. Okay, Council Member Marks. Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. I understand your concern about very low income, but I would be real worried about doing a deed restriction also, just in case we have some low income that's living there, I would hate to see them displaced. I am for this um, because this uh, trailer park serves a working population that has successfully lived there for many, many years. And if we were to change this and, and make it a 60 day stay, we would be displacing 160 some families and people who depend on this place for low income. So I'm, I'm very happy to see this and, and make this approval. All right, thank you. All right, council member Armendariz. Um, I also agree and I agree with council member Marks. I don't wanna see folks displaced, um, but, but um, I do think we need to keep an eye on things because we've seen rooms bunk beds in the in Silicon Valley be rented out uh, for the same amount of a small apartment. And so um, square space or footage doesn't necessarily dictate um, low cost anymore. We've seen, you know, ridiculous uh, amounts of rent being charged for very small spaces. So we, we have to be careful with that. It could very well become a reality in our in our community too. But I am in support of um, of this change, this exemption. Okay, seeing no other council member hands, I'm going to go to Christine and ask if we have any public comments. If you wish to speak on this item, please press star nine at this time or unmute your, uh, raise your hand. Seeing none. All right, back to council. Would anyone like to make a motion? I'll make a motion to approve. Okay. I have a question. I, have I understand, but do we have a second? Council Member Tovar, are you seconding it? Second. Okay, so we have a motion and a, well, we have a motion by Council Member Bracco, seconded by Council Member Tovar, and we have Council Member Marks who has a question or a point. Oh, well, Council Member Armanderas brought up a good point. And this is a question, I guess, for staff. If we begin to see that they are renting out um, spaces inside each of these little tiny homes or, or trailers, um, is there some way we can go back and make restrictions on that? As a council, can we ask for, I don't know, a, a resolution or an ordinance that would disallow them from doing that? I, I guess I don't understand your question. Okay. You well, I think I, okay. Uh, council member Armandaris, correct me if I misunderstood you, um, was one of your fears that if we allow for longer stays, your fear that maybe someone in the trailer park would start to rent out some of the beds in no. the Oh, it wasn't. Okay. No, I was I was saying we 
we should look into um, deed restrictions, maybe not for this case, but for others, oh, okay. um, because that, you know, it, it's no longer uh, a rule that square footage or lack thereof dictates a, a low, um, a low rent rate. Oh, okay. Then, ne then never mind. I'm fine. Okay. So we have a motion and a second to um, approve, to adopt a resolution granting an exemption from the 60 day length of stay requirement contained in CUP 0010 for Garlic Farm RV Park special occupancy use. So roll call vote. Council member Adam Mendez? Yes. Council member Bracco? Yes. Council member Hilton? Aye. Council member Laura Munoz? Yes. Council member Martz? Yes. Council member Tovar? Yes. Mayor Blankley? Yes, that passes unanimously. Okay. Item C, this is 9C, approval to enter into an exclusivity agreement with Shark Sports and Entertainment LLC to fully assess the potential of having the Sharks organization operate a new indoor recreational facility. Uh, Jimmy, I think you're going to start with this report, correct? Correct. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor, members of the City Council. Uh, to give you a little bit of past on on what the work has been done with the Sharks. The City Council has an ad hoc committee that has been talking to representatives of the San Jose, San Jose Sharks now for almost two years. And during that course of time, they have operated under an exclusive negotiating agreement that really uh, ensures that both parties have access to information and that those, co those um, conversations are, are confidential uh, business and financial discussions. Uh, the second ENA, as they call it, expired in May. And um, I, I can assure you that uh, there's been quite a bit of progress made in those discussions. And so in order to continue uh, with that uh, discussion, uh, we'd like to request that council authorize the city administrator to, uh, to enter into the third ENA with the Sharks. Um, the second part of this is, is really the financial component. Um, the Sharks have spent a significant amount of money on uh, evaluating our, our, our situation and our possibilities here in Gilroy. And it is time for the city uh, to decide if it is something that at least wants to explore further. Uh, because the, the main thing that we will get into that still needs to be presented to council and to the public is how does this thing get paid for? And in order to do that, it requires significant financial analysis and independent financial analysis uh, from an outside um, you know, source. Uh, and of course, that cost money. And so there are two requests this evening. One is to continue the ENA, which would be a, a, another year. And then second, authorize the seat administrator to spend up to $100,000 in evaluating these proposals uh, and getting expert advice in order to have a recommendation that we can make to council for your consideration at a future meeting. Uh, that concludes my report. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have on, on this topic. Thank you, Jimmy. Again, I'm going to step in first on this being um, on the ad hoc committee. And I want to point out that, uh, you know, even though this exclusivity agreement started in May of 2019, um, I just got on board in March. So for me, this has only been going on since March. And the benefit to the exclusivity agreement is so that the Sharks are able to share information that normally we would not be privy to. They, could, they will only do it under an exclusivity agreement so that they are promised that this information remains private, that that is how they, they keep us to that commitment. Also, even though we've been at this since May of 2019, the only significant money that the city has spent in all that time is to acquire agricultural land that we need in the ag mitigation one-to-one -one, um, exchange in order to develop this possible site. So this request here is because myself having come on in March, meeting with the ad hoc committee, which is council member Bracco and council member Marks, getting us to here, which is June, and wanting to have something to bring to the public, right? So the public can hear what is it we're talking about. We need the, the request for this money is so that we, the city, can now say, okay, what we need to put actual numbers to this. We need to look at what, is, what are the sharks requesting, which is two ice rinks with the promise of land for, for another two in the future. And what does Gilroy want out of this? We, we, might, we might want some kind of recreation center in there too, something that's like what the CRC is. This might be our indoor pool, gym, lockers, you know, that kind of thing for Gilroy. How does that get financed? I mean, it's through bonds, but you need 
a, lo a, a large bond and how does that bond get repaid? And so that's where the independent analysis comes in because we're not just gonna take the shark's word for how much money they're gonna generate and what that's gonna pay. We need independent analysis to tell us on X amount of bond, this is the monthly payment and this is what's coming in from these different activities. So that's where we are. The timeline with the sharks is in, when we meet in August, we are going, the city's gonna have a number that we will actually be able to say we might be able to entertain. They're supposed to do the same with the goal that in no more than a month from that, in September, the sharks want some kind of commitment or they would like to not spend any more of their money or waste any of our time. So when we get to that point, when we know that we have something to, to share, right now there's nothing to tell the public yet. We're, we're not really anywhere with anything specific. So then we can go to the public and start having outreach meetings that then have a, an agreement that comes back to council. And the sharks hope is that if we're that far, then by the end of this year, they are able to start construction and they are anticipating an 18 to 24 month construction period. So that's the, the timeline that we're hoping for. And if they aren't seeing Gilroy really happening by September, say, then this is probably not going to happen at all. So we're, we're getting close to something we can share with the public and have the public comment on what are those other things? What are those other amenities that we might want to have in there and at what cost? That's why we need this money. Okay, so that's my contribution here, Carol and Dion, if you would like to chime in since you're on the on the committee too, feel free. Otherwise, I'm just gonna go to general questions of the council before public comment. Oh, well, you were very articulate, Mayor. So okay. I feel like you. Okay. Great. Okay, council members, are, are there any questions before I go to the public? All right, then Christina, do we have anybody from the public who would like to speak on this item? If you wish to speak on this item, please press star nine to unmute yourself or raise your hand at this time. See none. Okay. I'll make a motion to enter into the exclusive the, the agreement. Okay, thank you. Do we have it? Oh, either one. Okay, sure. I'll go with Fred since it doesn't look like it's just the ad hoc committee. How about that? So there's the first and the second, and I see a hand by Council Member Hilton. So I'll, I'll pause there and, and go to his question. Thank you. Actually, it's, it's more of a comment, but I'm actually really looking for some confidence from, from you all too, because this is something prior to me getting elected. Um, I'm having a hard time getting behind this deal just in general, and, I, and I'll give you a couple examples why. The three initiatives that we're pursuing, the 536, um, you know, the Hillside Adventure Park, we've gotten hundreds of emails, public comments. I could put a name, a, a, a picture, or a face to that project. I've, I've heard from them. Uh, downtown uh, GDBA, the Gourmet Alley, um, you know, huge hundreds of turnout of, of people coming to visit on Saturday. There's a name, there's a face. I understand it. The Sharks, zero. Um, I, I played a part in the, uh, as chair of the bike ped commission, when we were trying to, uh, um, modify the phase three of the master plan of the Gilroy sports park, numerous people called in, um, for public support. None of it was for the sharks. The sharks didn't write a letter, um, didn't hear from them then haven't heard from them tonight. Um, I am all in support of this ad hoc committee moving forward and continuing to talk, but I honestly think that spending millions on a bond for something that I'm almost 100% sure there's no way that the sharks can guarantee and they're not willing to put that guarantee in writing that they will cover the expenses if we can't make it, if it can't be what we expect it to be or if they can't bring in the income, I don't think we can cover it. And the next meeting, the next agenda item is basically to tell the seniors um, that we don't have enough money to even build another resource center or anything like this. So we're going to be taking, you know, the name away and calling it something different. Um, I'm having a hard time getting behind it. I'm all good for the first part that Jimmy said, continue that ENA, but spending any more money when we've already spent millions on it, I'm having a hard time getting behind that. So I know there's already motion on the floor. I just want you guys to know where I stand on that. And yeah. if anybody wants to make me feel more confident. Yeah. The, the money, again, the money spent has just been on ag mitigation, which we have to do to do anything out there. Okay, Councilmember Leroy Munoz. 
Yeah, I, I would just say, Councilmember Hilton, I, you know, I, I can understand where you're coming from. I, I think that this project is certainly in a different camp than the other two projects that you referenced, just given kind of the sensitivities around the partner um, and, and kind of the nature of what we're trying to do here. I think what is what's what's reassuring to me is knowing the fact that we have, you know, the members of our our representatives here who are collectively kind of speaking for us, but also representing us and reporting back to us. They've, they've been meeting with the uh, the Sharks organization now for I, however many number of years it's been since we've been doing this project. And, and really they've done a very good job about keeping us informed every step of the way. I, I don't think that this binds our hands in any way to kind of continue doing that. Um, you know, it, it, it requires sometimes a little bit of, a, uh, of an investment of time and treasure to make something like this that is really kind of a game-changing opportunity uh, kind of come to life. So I think really looking at our representatives here who are speaking for us with the Sharks organization and have been so good about reporting back to us on a consistent basis, I think that's been very reassuring for me. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Marks. I have to admit, Council Member Hilton, I, I felt much like you did, you know, many months ago, because I was also very concerned about the amount of money that the city might have to spend. And would we get money back? Is this going to be good for the city? Is it going to generate stuff? And I have to admit, after our last ad hoc committee with the Sharks and the owner was present, um, I walked away feeling very confident and very comfortable. This is something for the community. And in my heart, I don't believe we're going to be losing any money. And, you know, Councilmember Bracco and, and Mayor Blankley, please, you know, correct me if you have a, a different feeling. Um, I feel good about this. It's something that's just totally different for Gilroy. And I think it's going to be very, very good you know, for the city, it's it's going to play right into our other two economic development projects, the downtown and the 536. So I feel way more comfortable. And, you know, you bring up a good point. We haven't heard from the public. And so I have no problem, you know, with the public emailing us or calling in August to give us a thumbs up or a thumbs down, you know, share your thoughts with all of us because, you know, this is your money too. All right. Thank yeah. you. We just have to give something to the public first to be able to comment on. We haven't been able to share anything because there really isn't anything to share yet. We don't, we just don't, it's all just been back and forth really since March. I can't speak to what's happened before then. This has gotten active since March. Right. And that okay. is a very good point. That's a very good point that we haven't been able to share. So okay. keep that thought in mind also. Okay. All right. Council member Bracco followed by council member Tovar. Yes. Um, council member Hilton, um, the subcommittee um, grappled with that a lot until like uh, council member Marcus uh, mentioned at our last meeting with the Sharks organization, we got reassured that the bond payment, if they didn't make, if, if we didn't get enough money, the bond payment gets paid first out of, they pay it. So that, that'll automatically be included in what they have to pay. But we really can't make any decisions right now until we get this done so we can share more information and, and get their financials and all that stuff in order. All right, Council Member Tovar. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you, uh, Council Member Hilton, for those questions and concerns. Um, Originally, when I was on the committee, um, I had the opportunity to go down with, with the other uh, members to um, uh, check out the uh, Anaheim Ducks that they built out there. And sort of the way it really revitalized the city out there and sort of, again, these are, you know, obviously we can't forecast what it will do for Gilroy, but just the potential and the possibility of the number of jobs, the in income, I mean, for me, that's really what stuck me. And it had many, many of the same concerns that you have today, you know, and those are very legitimate concerns. But I look at the possibility when we talk about economic development, economic recovery, uh, potential for uh, jobs, um, more income, all of that stuff. For me, that's what I look at. I think that, you know, depending where this goes, where this leads, I'm actually excited. I'm hoping that it does continue to move in the direction that I hope it does. 
But again, you do raise some excellent questions, but for me, I think it's something that we should keep keep moving forward with because again, I think it will eventually do good for our city if, if it comes to fruition. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, the, the, the upsides for Gilroy are, you know, the fact that we could possibly get this a recreation center in addition to that and attract more um, hotels and tournaments and things like what's out at the aquatic center and the soccer fields that are out that way. Those are the upsides, but it is not without risk. That is why we are asking for this money to use for a consulting firm to help us with that risk assessment, because even though council member Bracco said, you know, the sharks assured us they'll make the payments. Of course, that's what they're going to say. And we have every confidence that they're going to be able to make a large part of it. But no, in the end, it is the city that is on the hook in the end. And so that is what you call risk. And that is what we have to manage and mitigate. And we have to be aware of how much risk we are taking, how much we're willing to take. That's what comes back to council. Whatever it is we get comes back to council. But before we get that far down the road, we need the public involved too. And we just can't do that until we've done this last um, EPS analysis on how much of a bond can we pay? Because the risk is in how high the bond is. That's the risk. So maybe, maybe you can't afford to do the indoor pool as well. Maybe it is just a gym. These are the things that the public has to comment on. These are the things that we maybe want to get our Parks and Rec Commission involved in, right? These are the things that people have a right to participate in and ask themselves, what is it worth to me? Because I don't know that we'll have an opportunity to get this type of recreation center again anytime soon. What the Sharks are offering is to actually build it. We bond it, but they will get it built. And that is something they have the expertise in doing because they've done it all the time, we do not. So we bring the utilities to the site, but they build the whole thing. So it does come down to money and it does come down to risk. Those are all absolutely valid concerns. You're looking at someone who's very financially conservative. And I've said that to the Sharks organization, both the president and the vice president, they're aware of that. And so I think we're in the best possible position to go forward because we both so far really want this to happen. And I think that we were only at this for another couple of months before we're either doing it or we're not. So that's, that's the last of what I can share. But I, I would certainly hope that we get a developed sports park out of it. That's the whole point. Otherwise that sports park is just, you know, the city bought that land a long, long time ago at a very low cost because it was in a flood zone. And so if we don't develop it as a sports park that it was intended to be, then it's just gonna sit there. The ball, nothing's happening to the ball fields. They're great, but it would be nice. And this is an opportunity that I do think is a game changer as council member LaRomagno said. Okay, we have a motion, I forgot. We have a motion in a second, right? So we, yeah. I'm sorry, I forgot we already had a motion on the floor. Sorry, roll call vote. Council member Edwin Lettys? Yes. Council member Bracco? Yes. Council member Hilton? Aye. Council member Laura Munoz? Yes. Council member Marks? Yes. Council member Tovar? Yes. Mayor Blinkley? Yes. Great. That passed unanimously. Okay. All right. Next item on the agenda. Excuse me. I think the motion only covered A from what I heard at least. Oh, whoops, whoops, whoops. Sorry. Part B. Thank you, Andy. Yes, I also need a motion to authorize the city administrator to spend up to $100,000 from the unrestricted general fund balance on activities related to the financial analysis and feasibility of the project. I'll, I'll make that motion. Okay. Councilmember the Romanos made the motion, seconded by Councilmember Bracco. Roll call vote, please. Councilmember Edmund Lettys? Yes. Councilmember Hilton? Aye. Councilmember Bracco? Yes. Councilmember Laura Munoz? Yes. Councilmember Marks? Yes. Councilmember Tovar? Yes. Mayor Blankley? Yes. All right. Both, both passed unanimously. Okay, item 10, introduction of new business, renaming of the Gilroy Senior Center to encompass the enhanced recreation and community services provided. And Adam is gonna give us this report. And good evening, Madam Mayor Hi, Adam. and council members. Uh, my name is Adam Hennig, Recreation Manager. 
and I'll be presenting about the enhancements to the Gilroy Senior Center, including the additional services that will be provided by the Recreation Division and a request to rename the facilities. Sorry, it's on. There we go. All right. Uh, with rates of COVID declining and the county opening up, the city is exploring new ways to effectively use public spaces. In the 2020 Facility and Program Needs Assessment, it was pointed out there's a high unmet need for an all-inclusive indoor multi-generational community center to serve Gilroy's growing population. Since there is currently no funding earmarked for a major renovation, in reviewing the city's recreation facilities, it was recommended the senior center be converted to a community center that serves all ages throughout the day. The recommendation for the conversion was based on public input from council members, commissioners, residents, and seniors. Following these findings, recreation staff met with key stakeholder groups, which include the Mount Madonna YMCA, SourceWise, the gift shop, and the Senior Advisory Board, and received valuable feedback. In May, the Parks and Recreation Commission approved recommending to City Council the following new name the City of Gilroy Community Center. The conversion of the Senior Center provides a quick and cost-effective solution to addressing the unmet needs for facility space. It offers minimal disruption to existing services while providing an opportunity to deliver more offerings to all of our residents. Current senior services include YMCA-sponsored and Santa Clara County-funded nutritional lunch program, the art sponsored tax support service, city led recreational activities and club meetings. Also the adaptive program, which serves Gilroy's special needs population will continue to utilize the center. Other changes will also be taking place. This includes the recreation division staff moving its offices from city hall to the senior center. The room that was formerly used as a gift shop will now offer multi-use space and allow for various types of usage that will benefit the greater community. Examples include meeting space for senior service providers and clubs and boards, parent and me classes, presentations for small group lectures, trainings and meetings used by city staff and its partners, and traditional classroom space. Ultimately, the goal of the conversion is for the center to serve the entire community, regardless of age. Whether you are 90 or nine, the enhancements to the existing senior center will better accommodate the recreational and social needs of all residents. The action item before the council is to approve the recommendation by the Parks and Recreation Commission to change the name of the City of Gilroy Senior Center to the City of Gilroy Community Center. This concludes my report and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Adam. Council, do you have, uh, do I, I don't see any hands, anyone? Okay, now I do. Council Member Armadaris and then Council Member Hilton. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so as someone who worked at the, um, in a different life, I worked at the Gary Community Youth Center when it was on Six and Railroad um, in the old pg e building. Um, I worked there with Moxa and downstairs with the City Parks and Rec Center. And um, those two spaces were, were small, but combined, I think they were at about the same size as um, the current senior center. I'm wondering, um, and I can't imagine, I can't imagine uh, running program for youth and seniors there at the same time where we were, and we were in two different spaces. Um, so I'm wondering what kind of um, survey, what kind of feedback was sought out from the seniors who currently, um, who've been attending services there, right? It's been a senior center for as long as I can remember. Remember, what kind of um, uh, surveying of them was done and what kind of feedback did you get from um, people who received direct service from there, not the service providers? Well, you know, that, and that's what the, the assessment provided is that there was uh, ample amounts of statistically valid surveys. 
There were community forums that were held. There was an online survey that was held. And so it encompassed seniors as well as residents of various ages. And, and overwhelmingly, it was one of the most um, uh, largest requests in terms of parks and recreation facilities, which is to have an indoor community center. Um, and currently, the city of Gilroy does not have that. And to your first point about the, the ability to kind of coexist, having senior services and youth services side by side. And so senior services currently are not going to be disrupted by this. Students uh, between you know, kindergarten and 12th grade, they're in school during the senior services hour. Um, so the types of classes that would be coinciding with the senior services would be classes for toddlers when they would be accompanied by a parent um, or those classes would probably be taking place during the after school hours. It just gives us more options to play with rather than it being exclusive for one age group. And the are parent the parent and me classes not happening at Las Animas Park anymore in those facilities? Well, there was a preschool that was occurring there pre-COVID. Um, it was an early childhood recreation program, um, but it is currently not being used for that program. So that is correct. Um, are they being used at all, those facilities at Las Animas? Yeah, so, so during the pandemic, we actually used it as a, uh, a part-time after-school program. Um, they met two times a week. Um, and then currently, it's actually being used as a summer camp. Um, and we're looking to program out of it uh, additional types of recreation classes, possibly a preschool program. Okay. And then, Mayor, if I could, I have one more question about okay. the gift shop. Um, because oh, yeah. that's a good one. I've gotten a lot of calls, a lot of emails, and um, I can't go to a garage sale without uh, uh, one of our members of our senior community accosting me about the about that gift shop. And it just tells me how important it is um, to to the community of the folks who are um, active in the senior center. Um, so, how much space does it currently encompass, and what will it be after these proposed changes? So uh, I want to iterate that the, the gift shop, uh, the physical space will now be used for multiple types of use, usage. But in terms of providing that opportunity for seniors to, to sell their crafts, to sell their, you know, their the different supplies um, at an affordable rate, that will still be available. We're, we're thinking about creating a, a pop-up boutique you know, whether it be on a monthly or an every month basis. And so we'll provide the amenities so that they have the resources to do that. Um, and in terms of what it's going to be used for now, as I mentioned in the slide, <laughs> our, our plan is to, um, you, you know, provide basically open it up for all types of usage, which before when it was just the gift shop, it was exclusive. There was no opportunity to have other types of services and programs in there. Adam, could you expand on your interactions with the senior advisory board and your discussions with them as well? I think that might help us help you here. So, so there is also a senior advisory board, which, uh, which you know, provides uh, information, it advises staff on, on kind of senior related matters. Um, and we've been recently uh, restarting those meetings be because of the pandemic, there, there hadn't been meetings, but we've recently restarted them. And we've, you know, obviously informed them about these proposed changes that are taking place. And they have been overwhelmingly supportive of all of these changes, uh, they, they see the value in it. And they've also been reassured that none of the senior services that were offered before the pandemic are going away. There, there is no disruption to those. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Adam. Before I go to Councilmember Hilton, I just wanna say one thing on the gift shop, right? Cause Councilmember Member just brought that up. And I've been on this issue a lot too with the same emails and things we're all getting. And it's important to understand that the change is that the gift shop can no longer have exclusive use of the room. And that's what's disappointing to the people who have had exclusive use of that room for all this time, because of course they love that. And so no one is saying they can't have use of the room, but it has to be in a pop-up form where they have use of the room at certain times. And then they take it down so that the room can also be used for other things. Or they could have a different location where they do a pop-up. They just can no longer have exclusive use of the room that they've come to have exclusive use of all this time. Okay, Councilmember Hilton. Thank you, Mayor. 
Um, Adam, uh, so who is on the senior advisory board? Is that that I, that's not a city board, I assume. Like, how did how do you get on there? Who's made up of it? Who's making these recommendations? And I understand that what you're telling us, but how come they haven't provided any letters to the council or any letters of support of these actions are inside of our agenda packets? Well, well, I can't say as to as to why they haven't provided in terms of letters of support. Uh, but what I can say is that uh, the members, you know, comprise of people. One of whom is a former volunteer of the year, Ben Sasso. Another is a former Parks and Recreation Commissioner, Terry Berry, and another one is uh, just a, someone who's been very active on the senior um, center board for a number of years. I don't know the origins of the board, and you're right; it's not a, a city appointed board. Uh, it's not in the charter. Um, and so I don't know exactly how it began. But it, it was before COVID a uh, meeting on a monthly basis, and it was open to all senior center members. Um, and there would typically be, you know, anywhere from, you know, 20 to 30 uh, seniors there. Um, they would uh, essentially kind of uh, go over you know, what's, what's, what's the latest happenings, what's the latest trends that are going on in senior services. And they also oversee um, a, an 801 account, which, which is basically a small fund for making modest improvements to the senior center. Okay. Um, and uh, I, I can certainly understand the sensitivity of someone having their space for so long, as far as I know, um, to be disruptive. So thank you for publicly saying that you're not disrupting them. You will give them you know, whatever they need. I understand that. Um, is, uh, it, I understand that the, in the needs assessment also that it provided many recommendations. This, this council, this body, staff, we get recommendations all the time. Um, you know, at what are you, you're just asking us for a name change. You're not necessarily asking whether we would approve the actual moving of the rec center over there or the rec staff over there. The, I understand that that may be more operational. Um, am I correct in saying that, Jimmy? You're not looking for permission on that. It's a recommendation, but the way it's being presented, the way it was presented to the Parks and Rec Commission, even tonight, it sounds like, it, to me, it sounds like, well, didn't you know we were already doing that? That was a recommendation where it, there was plenty of recommendations in there. It says to recommend that you don't, that you hire out our, you know, consultants to do aquatics, but that's still coming back to the council to be a decision, whether it was part-time workers or that. Right, that right. Yes, Mr. Hilton, the, the recommendation to council tonight is simply for the name change. Movement of employees or where they sit or, or how they are is really up to the administration. And so we, we, uh, we evaluate that all the time, but that, that is the only recommendation. And you're right, there are numerous amounts of uh, recommendations in the study, and some of them are just not feasible. And so at this point, we're trying to address some of the things that we think we can do immediately and others will, will come down the road, but anything that, that is really incorporated in that study goes through council because we either need a change uh, of some sort that needs council approval or we need resources to do it. Thank you, I'm done, Mayor. All right, are there any other questions for Adam? Okay, then with that, I would like to go to public comment if there are any. Did I do that already? No. I don't think so. No, yeah. So, uh, Christina, do we have anybody who wants to speak? If you wish to speak on this item, please press star nine to unmute yourself or raise your hand at this time. See none. All right, thank you. So, yes, Council, this is just uh, approving the Parks and Rec Commission recommendation for a name change from the Gilroy to the City of Gilroy Senior, from the City of Gilroy Senior Center to the City of Gilroy Community Center. So looking for a motion for that. I'll make the motion for that. Is there a second? Wow, nobody wants to change the name? I'll make the second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to change the name. So let's just go straight to the roll call vote. Councilmember Armandariz? No. Councilmember Bracco? No. Councilmember Hilton? No. Councilmember Laura Munoz? Yes. Councilmember Marks? No. Councilmember Tovar? No. Mayor Blankley? Yes. Okay. I'm not, <laughs> so that, that failed. Um, 
Okay, wait, that failed. I lost count. How many no votes were, I mean, how many? Two, five yes. to two. Okay, two, two of us voted uh, were yes and five were no. Okay, so darn, I was thinking how cute it would be to have little toddlers and seniors cross paths, but I, I don't know that this necessarily, yeah, this doesn't change the operations. We're just saying we didn't approve the name change, right? Correct. Interesting, okay. All right, moving on to item B. Approve the implementation of the five-year plan for the Santa Clara County multi-jurisdictional program for public information associated with the community rating system of the National Flood Insurance Program. Daryl, are you around? I am around, yes. All right, you're on. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Honorable Council. Let me get this put up here real quick. Excuse me. Thank you for your patience. Uh, good, good evening. Tonight, uh, we're going to talk about the approval and implementation of the five-year plan for the Santa Clara County Multi-Jurisdictional Program for Public Information Associated with Community Rating System of the National Flood Insurance Program. A little bit of background here is the city has been participating in this system uh, since May 1st of 2007. Uh, the Santa Clara County Water District and 14 other jurisdictions within Santa uh, Clara County communities are participating in the CRS system. Uh, while the PPI was developed jointly, it must be individually approved by each community's elected body in order for the community to receive the CRS credits for its implementation. That's why we're here tonight. Uh, the city's CRS class rating provides for a 10% flood insurance discount for properties located within the special flood zone hazard area or 100 year floodplain and a 5% discount for non flood floodplain properties. The city currently has 123 of its properties in the 100 year floodplain and 17 in the non floodplain areas that have flood insurance policies which benefit from this program. The result is a combined savings of 20 over $23,000 annually for the Gilroy policyholders. Um, Basically, um, in conclusion, this multi-jurisdictional PPI will allow the city to earn additional CRS credits to increase the flood zone insurance policy discounts for the citizens of Gilroy and will be an additional tool for the city uh, can use to reduce flood risks. At no cost to us, we get all the benefit. It's a win-win for us and would like to have your recommendation tonight to approve this matter. Any questions? I don't know yet. Council? Um... Let's see, can you remove the PowerPoint and sure I'll... Okay, council members, anybody with a question? All right, uh, public comment. Christina, any public comment? If you wish to speak on this item, please press star nine to unmute yourself or raise your hand at this time. See none. Okay, back to council. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Okay. Motion to approve by council member Bracco, seconded by council member Tovar, approving the implementation of the five year plan for Santa Clara County multi jurisdictional program for public information associated with the community rating system of the National Flood Insurance Program. So, roll call vote. Council member Armendariz? Yes. Council member Bracco? Yes. Council member Hilton? Aye. Council member Laura Munoz? Yes. Council member Marks? Yes. Council member Tovar? Yes. Mayor Blankley? Yes, that passes unanimously. All right, item C, report on reopening of city offices on August 30th, 2021. I think Leanne and Jimmy are giving this, right? In whichever order? Uh, that's correct, Madam Mayor. I'll, I'll start us off here. Um, can, can you see the PowerPoint? Not yet. Okay, sorry. All right, there we go. All right, good evening, uh, Mayor, members of the City Council. As you well know, the, uh, the world of COVID-19 is, is changing drastically day by day. Uh, things are starting to reopen in, in many ways, including mass gatherings 
and uh, events that have not been held in over a year and a half. In fact, this is our uh, third to last council meeting we will do remotely as we will be back in person in September uh, at your first council meeting in, in, in that month. Uh, the next step for us as a city is to begin the process of reopening City Hall. Um, city operations will not be like they were when we uh, we left uh, last March, uh, primarily due to, to how uh, our clients have, and customers and residents have changed. Uh, they do more things online now. They do more things virtually on Zoom or WebEx or whatever or whatever platform you use. And so we are looking to reopen the office, uh, taking those types of changes into consideration to provide the best customer service um, opportunity we can uh, for not only our residents and customers but also our employees. And, and knowing that more of their work will be done uh, online and it, virtually as opposed to as much foot traffic as we had before, there will simply be people who will not wanna return to City Hall for quite some time. So the presentation you have tonight is going to take you through uh, the environment we're working in, the environment we're dealing with, and then also what our adjustments uh, we are uh, implementing as we continue to reopen for that target date of August 30th. So with that, I'm gonna have Leanne walk you through the first slides and then I'll, I'll do the second half. So go ahead, Leanne. Good evening, Mayor, members of the council. Uh, so we've experienced quite a few changes of in the month of June with respect to uh, some of the regulations and orders relative to COVID-19 and, and what we must comply with as an employer, uh, which comes to us from Cal OSHA. Uh, so we've had quite a few changes in, in that area. Uh, one of the major changes is that currently masks are optional for those who are fully vaccinated with a few exceptions. And those include um, on public transit, healthcare, um, indoors for school, childcare, and youth recreation type programs. And so um, we've made some adjustments and have had a lot of communication with our employees relative to this. And we're, we're continuing to adjust um, our city operations around uh, where the current state of the law and orders have landed. Um, business, the Santa Clara County Public Health Department is still recommend, making recommendations to businesses and government uh, to include continuing to encourage uh, vaccinations, um, and in further increase the um, very good uh, vaccination rate that we've seen in Santa Clara County, uh, but they, they're continuing to uh, press forward with uh, increasing that percentage, uh, encouraging outdoor operations where possible, um, limiting work travel for unvaccinated workers to areas with elevated COVID-19 rates, and again, continuing testing for unvaccinated personnel or, or anyone with COVID-19 symptoms. And so these are all the things that, that we as a government entity um, have to consider and comply with as we move forward. Next slide. We've been preparing for reopening actually for quite some time because um, whoever thought back in March of 2020 that we'd be sitting here um, on July 1st of 2021 still not open uh, to serve our community. It's, it's mind blowing. Uh, but we began back, uh, back shortly after uh, the closure uh, with optimism that we would open much sooner. Uh, so we've, we way back then and started installing things like plexiglass at public, our public front counters um, and making some other changes to our physical um, areas of, of our city offices in, in preparation and readiness for reopening. Um, now, now, for example, um, the new orders uh, indicate that the plexiglass partitions are not required, um, but we will keep in place those that we have now for the extra protection that they do provide. We've also moved forward with um, adjustments to our air filtration through our HVAC system and the kinds of filters that we have um, in our city facilities and as well as, well as utilizing um, other um, standalone air filters uh, that uh, address the particles associated with the virus. Uh, just trying to make the workspace and the space that our customers will enter as safe as possible. Um, we've had some, um, we're planning for some office moves and reorganization um, with the uh, recreation uh, staff, the much smaller now recreation team um, moving over to the um, senior center um, uh, that frees up that wing of the city hall building, which is ideal for the finance department. 
And uh, we have a lot of customers that come in to the finance department for utility billing needs and business license needs and those kinds of things. And it will be nice to um, have that more dedicated uh, counter area um, and a little bit more security for the functions that happen in the finance department, uh, which then frees up space, you know, in the central area of City Hall where we can have employees spread out a little bit more um, and be able to um, better serve the public. Uh, we're planning for a concierge concept. Um, the, the recommendations um, that we've read and all the best practices are to um, you know, try to have a single point of entry. Um, so we want to have a customer service desk uh, that manages the traffic flow coming into City Hall. We do think it will be uh, lower uh, than we saw prior to um, the uh, pandemic, uh, but, but we want to make sure that we're coordinating that well um, and not, um, not having any customers uh, left waiting. Um, the concierge service will allow for appointments to be scheduled and a dedicated time uh, to meet with uh, staff. Um, and then signage is going to be key. Uh, it, it's going to be confusing at first, uh, you know, as to where you enter City Hall um, and, and where you go for certain services. So we think that signage um, around the facility is going to be critical to ensuring that we um, uh, direct uh, folks to the right location and, um, you know, not have them, you know, wondering where to go. Uh, next slide. So as noted, um, having a single point of entry is critical. Um, already mentioned the relocation of the recreation uh, department and finance utility billing. And then the uh, we've been waiting uh, you know, for the council chambers to be modernized. That project uh, begins this month um, um, with the council chambers, the, uh, with uh, improving the um, technology availability within the chambers, which will be really important for facilitating the hybrid meetings that we will need to be um, offering to our community, uh, where members of our public can come to us in, you know, in person when, when we reopen and have the in-person council meeting, and then also participate virtually. Um, so the, having, having the council chambers modernization project will be pivotal to that. Um, and then we'll have a single point of entry uh, during the times of council meetings. So we're limiting, um, you know, who's flowing through the building at different times. Next slide. And then we have some um, specific target dates. We have uh, July and August. Um, we're transitioning most of our employees back to on-site work uh, because we want to be very ready to serve the community uh, come August 30th when we reopen City Hall. Um, September 13th is an important date because that's the first in-person city council meeting that we intend to be ready for. And then uh, with that going forward, uh, we envision October of 2021 uh, being able to facilitate a return to in-person boards, commission, and committee meetings. And then I'll pass it back to Jimmy. Okay, thank you, Leanne. Uh, so as I, I previously described, we, we are, we're being really required to change our, our customer service approach and how we deliver customer service because that's what our, our residents and um, customers are expecting from us. Uh, we know already that more of our services will be online and, and virtual. Um, the meetings that people drive from San Francisco or Walnut Creek and Sacramento will now be conducted uh, virtually. Uh, I don't think that will change. Uh, it'll change some, but the in-person meetings that we've had in the past are, I think, are going to be less sporadic. I think that's something that most cities are expecting. Um, and so most of our customers will continue that practice. We also expect that a lot of our meetings will be quicker. Uh, they'll be shorter. And, um, and, and then also that a lot of what we have done, especially uh, in the last uh, several years to make things more accessible, will be accessible 24-7. Uh, you don't have to call uh, you know, utility billing right now to make a payment. You can do that at any time. You can do that in your jammies if you want to. And a lot of people do. And they've certainly done it much more over the last uh, 18 months or so as they figured out that we're not here for them. And we wanted to be here for them, but we couldn't. And so, um, yes, we'll have that return, but people will also have gotten used to utilization of technology as well. Uh, the second fact is that we are a smaller workforce. Uh, we, we know we went through layoffs and we did replace some employees recently with the adopted budget, but we are smaller. And so um, the ability for us to uh, be more efficient by utilizing some online virtual services or technology is gonna be even more important at this point. And the other feedback we're getting is that there's just some customers are not ready to come into a city office. And so there are those who maybe are not uh, vaccinated or are just not comfortable yet 
uh, may take them quite some time. So we propose to do uh, do this in two phases as our reopening. And uh, you know, like we do talk a lot of times, is that we uh, it's important that we get the feedback from our customers because a lot of this is being implemented because of feedback we are getting from our customers. And so our our phase one is August 30th to December 23rd, and that'll be. Uh, approximately four months where we would be open from 8 30 to 4 p.m monday through thursday and then fridays we would be close to direct access but by appointment uh, by virtual meeting and by online uh, that recognizes the fact that our employees will be doing more of this electronic type of work so knowing that um, they can meet face to face with our customers monday through thursday uh, is, 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 a, is a good balance of, uh, of that approach but also acknowledging that more time will be spent and dedicated to these um, appointments on Friday or virtual meetings, which we would expect our employees to, um, to then um, utilize. Uh, as you may recall, uh, previously the city was city hall was closed during that holiday period of uh, basically Christmas Eve to uh, New Year's Day. And so we will recommend that that be the same uh, condition that we do. It worked really well for employees to be able to take time off, but also those that didn't wanna take time off, they were able to, uh, to work in the office and continue and uh, public safety and other essential services, uh, you know, water shutoffs, uh, you know, issues uh, associated with that will remain open and available. And then phase two is really the, the general reopening at its fullest, but also a difference in customer service approach. Um, we have received feedback from some of our customers that we are only open from eight to five and many people work during those hours. And so the thought is that we would like to try opening earlier and staying open later and see what kind of response we get from our customers and do that Monday through Thursday. And then again, Fridays by appointment. So we would extend the hours during those four days of the week. And then uh, it's important too that, uh, you know, we communicate this and why we're doing this. And so uh, we'll uh, not only be responding to uh, changes in our customers, but we're also going to have to communicate to them how we're responding. And so uh, that takes me to the next, next piece, which is really, I think the most important is, uh, after presenting this to council tonight, we start that reopening plan communication. I think most people know we intend to open in August, at the end of August, and that we intend to have open uh, council meetings in person in September. But we wanna start communicating that and in English and Spanish in a variety of platforms. We have certainly learned through COVID that not everybody has internet access, not everybody gets things through social media. And so getting this information to everybody in, in the city is important and, and, and through a variety of platforms. But the really, I think the key to this entire process is customer surveys and feedback. We need to make sure that this is what our customers want. And if they want us to continue doing it, and if they don't, we won't do it. Uh, so uh, we will be setting up a customer service process, a survey process that enables them to give us that feedback, feedback. And we'll share that back to council so that council understands uh, maybe the reasons why or why not we're not doing something. And, and we also wanna hear from council what they're hearing from their constituents and what, the, and what they would like to see their city hall be. And then also we need employee feedback. Um, it is going to be a struggle, I think, for many employees to go back into the workforce, both uh, logistically, but also mentally. Uh, many of our employees have been out of the office for a year and a half. And I can tell you, as we see new employees come back in, it is a little awkward. And, and some of us don't quite know how to act yet. And so uh, we need to make sure that we keep that in mind. And, and we feel this is a good opportunity to um, make a balance of being accessible to our customers, but also balancing the changes that the, the customer service impacts will have on our employees. So uh, this is really the, the high level. Um, we passed over a lot of things not explaining to you about reopening. And, and the, pro the primary reason is that they're already open. And one area is recreation. Our rec recreation um, programs are back in person. Uh, they will be continuing to evolve and become more in person over the next couple of months. So that's not really a phasing in, that's just really a, a timing of how our, uh, our fall programs will restart. Uh, things like swimming programs and such were shut down for the summer. Uh, we will evaluate how to pr provide those programs uh, going forward and for next summer. Uh, public surface, uh, sorry, excuse me, public service. Uh, public safety services and public works operations have continued to be open. So there's not really a reopening of that. So uh, uh, that's why we're primarily focusing on city hall and that that is really the, uh, the face of, of the city and of city government. And so uh, that feedback is important to get from not only our council, but our customers and our employees. 
So that, that concludes our, our formal presentation. We would appreciate any questions or any feedback you have as we, uh, we go down this endeavor. And we have, a, we, we have already established some, some good internal workings. We have about two months to put this all together. And it's not exactly um, uh, going to be difficult uh, to incorporate, but it's going to be uh, maybe a challenge to make sure that we're there for the residents and they understand what we're, we're trying to accomplish and how we're trying to help them. So. Uh, that concludes my presentation. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Leanne and I would if, if you have any. Thank, thank you, Jimmy. I see Councilmember Bracco's hand up. Go ahead. I have a couple comments. One is, you know, everybody's pretty much back to work. Stadiums are open. Arenas are open with little or no restrictions. I don't understand why we take so long to open back up. And also, I, I question the thinking behind adding more traffic to the senior center when seniors are at risk. That, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. If Jimmy could address that. Well, I, I think the first uh, the object is that, uh, you know, government has different responsibilities. Uh, we have different risk involved with what our operations are, and we also didn't have the ability to reopen. Uh, other businesses were able to, other, other entities, other uh, functions were, and so we were the last to be permitted to open. Um, we, we, so, and in, in, in furthermore, our plan is really pretty consistent with what we're seeing throughout the county. And so uh, there are some certain county offices that are reopening, but the majority of cities are looking for a late August or, or September reopening for those services. And it's primarily based on the adjustments you have to make and the fact that we just weren't able to reopen. Um, I, I think the, the issues at the senior center that you discuss is that we have, we've made a conscientious effort in utilizing that facility, but not utilizing it all at the same time. Um, as Adam Hennig, the recreation manager stated, uh, the majority of programming that goes on during the day is for seniors because kids are in school. And uh, at night, kids are not in school and seniors are at home. So uh, we do balance that, but we also know that a lot of our seniors got vaccinated and a lot of them got vaccinated at the senior center. Uh, so they will continue to come, but we don't expect that those types of um, operations to really conflict or add any additional foot traffic, like a peak volume, uh, because they are so uh, different, differently scheduled. Okay. Council Member Armendariz. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, Jimmy, for the information. Um, I'm wondering, oh, first, also thank you for uh, keeping in mind those folks who are on the other side of the digital divide who don't have access to um, online services or you know good uh, internet connection or the tech savviness to um, access our um, our services through um, the internet. So so thank you for keeping them in mind and providing uh, you know still providing services in person that they can reach. Um, uh, but the second um, question I have is in regards to the safety of of staff in the return. Um, are we looking into benchmarks um, for COVID numbers, um, hospitalizations, all that stuff in terms of uh, taking steps to, to prevent um, risk, unnecessary risk? At, like, so will we close down again if X percent of infection rates happen again in Gilroy or in the county, or do we leave that up to the city? Um, have we negotiated anything like that with our bargaining units? Well, I, I, I'm going to address it, but I want Leanne to jump in too, because she's had discussions um, with those groups much more closer than I do. Uh, I, I think if we do see an uptick, um, if we see a strain or whatever, um, it's, it's important that we continue to follow the guidance of the county. Uh, because they are the experts. They have the, the, the ability to give us information that we just don't have. Uh, we don't keep track of those kinds of things. So in my discussions with the county and with the other uh, managers, uh, the, 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 the feeling is that if we have to, we will. Uh, but there's not been an indication. The numbers have gone the right direction, but I would agree with you. There's not saying that it couldn't go the other direction. And we would simply do what we had done before. Uh, where we shut down and we have to re revise how we provide service. So we're certainly we're good at that now because we had to do it before. Uh, it wouldn't be a, a heavy lift. Um, I'll let Leanne address her, uh, her workings with the labor groups and how we're working through some of these things with them. 
So the the first thing that I'll share is that um, we we have a, a citywide safety committee that has representatives um, from all departments um, and including um, bargaining unit representatives on the committee. And this group has been discussing um, um, items related to COVID-19 safety for our employees, um, you know, you know, since, um, I mean, we took a couple months off right after March, but then the committee started, started dis meeting again and discussing these things monthly uh, shortly thereafter. Um, so we get a lot of input from our employees um, and there's a lot of opportunity for anyone to bring forward any concerns they, they may be having regarding anything that, that is happening or not happening in the workplace relative to COVID-19 safety. One of the things that will be continuing uh, forward and consistent with the, um, the information that we've received from the county and from Cal OSHA is that we still have exposure reporting requirements um, and we, we still um, have to proceed forward with um, with um, offering testing to employees. Um, we, that one of the reasons we decided to keep the plexiglass up, even though it's not required, uh, was because of input from employees. It just makes them feel a little bit more comfortable um, that, the, that we're keeping the plexiglass up as an uh, additional layer of protection uh, for them should an unvaccinated person come into the building um, um, or somebody who's unknowing, you know, doesn't know that they're in, you know, infectious and uh, they're interacting with city staff. Uh, we are going to, we plan to provide masks to our customers if they need one or want one. And then our employees have the option also to continue to mask up if they feel that that provides them with that extra layer of protection, um, all the way up to N95 masks that we have available for city staff. Uh, so we're trying to uh, take all, you know, those kinds of measures in addition to the cleaning, 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 you know, constantly uh, to uh, make sure that we're, we're keeping our workspaces as, as clean as possible. But we've kind of reached a, a point where um, we're ready to, um, you know, resume our services and get our, our staff back on site in all of our city departments to uh, be meeting the needs of our customers and, and to, um, you know, continue our efforts for the priorities that the council has set forth for us. Thank you for that, Leanne, and thank you for taking those measures. All right, thank you. So Council Member Tovar followed by Council Member Hilton. Thank you. Thank you, Leanne and Jimmy. Uh, Jimmy, you touched on something that's very important. Um, sort of the transition period that it's going to take our employees to go from a year and a half of working from home now going back into the office, you know, and, and many of us have seen, you know, now that people are going back to work, just in, in my employee, you know, we're seeing it's a lot more difficult for a lot of folks. Um, they say, you know what, I can't do this. And they, they end up quitting or leaving because they, they don't want to come back into the office. Two-part question, A, do we have resources set up for those individuals that may have a hard time transitioning back into the workplace? And B, you know, do we have a plan B in case we start to lose employees who say, you know what, I'd rather not do this anymore and decide to leave? Well, uh, yes, Mr. Tovar, we have a, a concern program that we offer to all employees that provides mental health assistance. Um, I make it a point during all hands meetings to tell people to take a care take care of what's between their ears. Um, I do that almost every meeting that if people are struggling or they need help or whatever, we have it for them. Don't, you're not alone. And so we are very cognizant and we are getting that feedback from some employees already about the anxiety of returning. Right. Right. Um, I can tell you, we are going to have employees that won't come back, but the reason why they may not come back is we may have some people that just moved. Uh, they have worked remotely for a year and a half and uh, maybe have relocated or have just felt that they wanted to move away. Um, uh, so we don't really have a good grasp of that. We won't know until we reopen, but uh, I think we are, uh, I think a lot of cities are gonna run into that, that people are just, maybe they've just moved too far away or have gotten comfortable working from somewhere else. And if that becomes a, a large problem recruiting and retaining, we'll have to address that. No, and I, and I appreciate that because yeah, I think you guys are ahead of the sort of the, the curve here because you do anticipate that that may, or it is already happening, you know, and I think as long as we're at the, you know, you know, ahead of it, ahead of the game and say, okay, what's, what's our plan in case we do start to see many employees leaving. Thank you. What I would add to that council member Tovar is that we have, we started a uh, sort of a slow transition um, that kind of began in the May, June timeframe. 
of, of e having folks ease themselves back into the workplace um, in the situation where they were working 100% at home. Um, you know, some of our employees never left. Uh, because we are a government entity and we have essential services that we're providing. But for those employees who, who were away from the workplace, um, they've been easing back in, you know, one day a week, two days a week, and then now July, uh, moving that up to three days a week. So that come August, we're, we're, you know, we've eased back in and we've given them that transition time to get to that place of, of returning to, you know, a regular uh, kind of work schedule. And, um, one other thing I would add is, you know, the August 30th date in some ways was a bit deliberate uh, because of kids going back to school in mid-August. And we have a lot of employees that have um, school-age children um, and or needed some ramp up time to line up their, their, their daycare that, that they didn't have um, during that time period. So we gave employees a, a lot of lead time, a lot of notice to be able to plan for these things and to get their kids situated back in school uh, before we op reopen the city offices. So we've tried to take a really balanced approach um, with, with the care of our employees in mind as we have um, readied ourselves to reopen to the public. Thank you, thank you both. All right, Council Member Hilton followed by Council Member LaRomagnos. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, Leanne and Jimmy. And Leanne, just to counter off what you just said right there, I, I'm, you know, I'm a working father. My child's in school. And just the fact that you guys thought about that, um, kudos to you. Thank you for taking care of the staff. I think it's a solid, um, it's a solid plan. Um, Jimmy, I mean, you led us into this. Um, I, I'm confident that you can continue doing that. And if you need to scale back, you know exactly how to scale back. Um, I'm confident that, that with you working with other city managers throughout Santa Clara County, um, that you all are sharing best practices and, uh, and, and, and what has worked. Um, so I support the plan. Thank you. Thank you. Council member Laromanos. Jimmy, a lot of good things in the report you shared. One of the things that, you know, I, I was excited to hear about is the, the trial of this kind of extended hours for services. This is just one of those personal things that always just infuriates me whenever I try to set appointments for anything. And it's always like, yeah, it's always eight to five. And it's like, well, we got work. I don't know what to tell you. Um, so I am thrilled to see we're going to be doing that. My only question on that was uh, if we're going to do extended hours, is there any uh, budget impact? I might have I might have missed that. I think if it is, it's so nominal or minimal that it's not worth us pointing out to you. Gotcha. Uh, you know, we're still covering the same amount of hours with employees. The electricity is going to be on close to the same amount of hours and maybe a little more, but I don't think it's anything that we would, uh, we would show concern of. Perfect. That's all I need to know. Great to hear it. Thanks. Okay. I don't see any other hands and this is something that uh, maybe there is there any from the public who wants to speak on this item. If you wish to speak on this item, please press star nine to unmute yourself or raise your hand at this time. See none. Okay, thank you. Then uh, back to council. This is just receive report and provide feedback. So uh, Jimmy, Leanne, do you have your, do you feel good? Oh, great. Okay, well then great, moving on. All right, item 11. Oh, wait. I have to adjourn to the meeting of the Gilroy Public Facilities Financing Authority, right? Okay, so I've done that. Now can I adjourn the Gilroy Public Facilities Financing Authority? No, no, we, we, you, you have moved to the, you have moved to that meeting and now need to call a, a roll call of the, of the Public Facilities Financing Authority. Okay. Um, roll call, Christina, please, of the Gilroy Public Facilities Financing Authority. Uh, Board Member Armendariz? Yes. Board Member Bracco? Here. Board Member Hilton? Here. Board Member Lerone Munoz? Present. Board Member Marks? Here. Board Member to uh, Tovar? on the screen um, and board member Blinkley here 
Okay, so I don't know if you count that as six or seven, but all right. Um, adopt a resolution authorizing investment of funds in the local agency investment fund. And Harjot will be telling us about this, right? Absolutely. Uh, good evening again. My name is Harjot, city's finance director, also the uh, treasurer for the, um, uh, the, the authority. The item before you is uh, for the adoption of a resolution of the Gilroy Public Facilities Financing Authority, authorizing the investments of uh, monies in the local agency investment fund, which is also known as LAFE. Uh, as the city administrator, Forbes shared with you at the June 21st council meeting, uh, the city successfully priced and sold the bonds for the uh, uh, Scraw plant expansion project. Um, so uh, we uh, just closed uh, the deal yesterday and received the funds um, with our trustee. Uh, so what we're asking uh, is basically we're going to be investing those dollars uh, with the LAFE, uh, LAFE account, which is the state's uh, treasurer's uh, pooled money account. And essentially the recommendation is to maintain um, quick access for cash flow purposes while uh, still earning uh, some interest. And we're recommending to temporarily invest those dollars in account uh, in account with the LAFE. Um, LAFE does uh, provide uh, higher dollar uh, values and quick access to the cash. And primarily, that's really the reason uh, we're indicating, uh, while also providing uh, you know, competitive interest earnings um, uh, for us. So that uh, essentially concludes uh, my report. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Council, any questions? <clears throat> OK, do we have any public comment? If you wish to speak on this item, please press star nine to unmute yourself or raise your hand at this time. See none. Okay, um, back to council then. Uh, we need a motion to adopt a resolution for this item if anybody's willing to make a motion. So moved. Second. All right, motion, motion made by council member Arwindari, seconded by council member LaRoman Yos to adopt a resolution of the Gilroy Public Facilities Financing Authority authorizing investment of monies in the local agency investment fund. Roll call vote, please. Board member Armandaris? Yes. Board member Bracco? Yes. Board member Hilton? Aye. Board member Laura Munoz? Yes. Board member Marks? Yes. Board member Tovar? Yes. And board member Blankley? Yes, all right, that passes unanimously. Okay, now we adjourn to the meeting of the Gilroy City Council. So back, but we don't have to do another roll call, right? That's no. correct, we just move okay. on. All right, so city administrators reports. Uh, all thank, right. thank you, Madam Mayor. I have a, a rather lengthy report tonight because uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the water drought and the city's response, but I wanna give you an update on two items. Uh, one, this Sunday, the city is hosting the uh, fireworks show at Gilroy High School at approximately 9.30. Uh, we please uh, look on our website to see any road closures or any traffic impacts that you may have in the area. And as we have done very much so in our social media, we are asking people to please be smart, be safe, and understand that we are right now residing in a, around a lot of fuel that is not going to take much to uh, turn a, a very uh, dangerous situation into a very deadly one very quickly. Uh, that segues nicely into uh, a report I wanna give you concerning the Uroy Fire Department. Um, as a city administrator, I get nervous whenever we send um, our firefighters out of the area to help with some of the issues going on in the state. But I also like to let council know so they know that um, uh, when they're out there that we're, we're keeping an eye on them, we're, we're, we're hoping they're safe and also knowing that we hear all the time that we have some of the best people you could possibly find. Uh, I'm gonna read this from Chief Wyatt, uh, basically saying that um, uh, we displaced, uh, a fi uh, the fire department strike team has been uh, diverted to the SALT uh, fire you may have heard of outside of Redding, California. And they have worked all night trying to uh, save residences and prevent the closure of I-5. That SALT fire is now 2,800 acres and uh, they're gonna get some rest later today, but so far our strike team of UI firefighters is safe, healthy, and in good spirits. So uh, I'll let you know when they get back because then I can stop worrying about them and you can too, and then hope that uh, everybody returns safely. 
Uh, so with that, we will transition. I'm going to uh, ask our public works director, Daryl Jordan, uh, to do this presentation on uh, the water issues that we are uh, we are having uh, throughout the state and uh, you know the western part of the United States. Um, as you may recall, the uh, the Valley Water or used to be Santa Clara Valley Water District did a recent um, declaration of a water emergency and drought. And we're going to talk to you about what we're doing and what we plan to do to make sure that our residents are doing their part. Uh, to make sure we have enough water for everyone and that we're able to uh, to continue to do so. So, uh, Daryl, go ahead. Thank you, Jimmy. <clears throat> Share my screen here, please. Okay, um, as Jimmy uh, introduced, we're going to be discussing the drought and the efforts that we're working on currently here at the city. Um, for those of you who've been kind of following information coming uh, through the water district, it looks like uh, we're at least 13 feet lower in our aquifer, our sub basin that we draw from from the city for our um, residential water here in town, commercial water. Uh, on June 9th, the Valley Water adopted a resolution uh, due to the emergency uh, suggesting a 33% water use reduction compared to 2013. Uh, this has resulted in a level two water shortage emergency call, uh, which looks, which they're calling a 21 to 35% reduction. And there's some baselines involved here that we'll talk a little bit about that. But to give you a little bit more um, context, uh, every day during these, these uh, hot days that we're going through right now, we're pumping approximately 10 million gallons out of the groundwater every day. Uh, and that's coming um, through all of our municipal pumps and 100% uh, groundwater. So what, is, what does level two mean? What is it gonna look like? Uh, what's the difference from where we've been? Uh, we've been in uh, the level one for several years now with the last drought, and that moved us to a three-day watering period for our residential zones. Uh, the level two, we're gonna have to switch to a two-day per week. Uh, so we'll lose one of those three days per week for, uh, for watering. Obligations under the uh, level two uh, would be any leaks um, around town will need to be fixed within 48 hours. Uh, there's limits to uh, ornamental ponds or pools. They are actually prohibited during our level two uh, situation. And uh, our ordinance now says that the drought water rates could be considered uh, through council discretion on how we might uh, uh, change those or modify those to benefit the community. Um, so what are we actually doing right now? If we look back, um, our baseline water use in 2013, we targeted a 15% reduction at level one in 2016 approved by our council. And this was, and we actually accomplished that. We did a great job for this community. We met our, our goals and we did it well. Now we're targeting an additional, at least 15% based on our 2019 baseline for our new level two requirements. So what we're doing for um, education and outreach is that uh, our water department with our actually shortened staff due to our uh, budget issues have done a fantastic job um, this last year, um, meeting with over almost a thousand different households this year, one-on-one um, -on -one discussing ways that they can uh, more economically use their water, uh, show them how to set their timers, um, just uh, multiple solutions to help our residents uh, meet these goals. And they've been uh, probably, I, what I'm hearing is about maybe 80 or 90 percent effective in just that one-on-one -on -one time we spent. We still have 10, 15 percent of users out there uh, that we don't have in compliance yet. And just just to make a, a note, compliance is our priority. We don't want to be uh, actually finding people when we don't have to. But if we can get people into compliance, which is our main goal, we think we can actually meet these goals of the, these uh, level two that we're talking about. Um, so the city has been implementing uh, user-friendly water monitoring, or will be implementing a water-friendly uh, water, water monitoring application. I'm working with the, our finance director. He's got some recent uh, experience with implementing one up at Morgan Hill. We're going to be looking at that same option. It's very user-friendly. Every household can just download the application on their home computer or their smartphone, and they can monitor their own use at their own house. It will show them if they have a leak or if they're exceeding the baseline that uh, we set for uh, different residential zones or whatever. And it's a, it's a great communicator. So we're working on that together and hopefully we get that uh, kicked off here shortly. 
Uh, with a new budget, thank goodness, thank you, uh, Council. Uh, we've got two of our water conservation staff returning. We've missed them over the uh, last year and a half. Uh, they're going to be joining our team here this month and uh, spearheading our outreach and Im implementation for this program to help everybody get into compliance and meet our goals. Um, the uh, Valley Water has uh, mentioned that they're going to have a numerous amount of tools that they're going to provide us. We haven't received those yet. I wish we had those, uh, but we expect them shortly to help us uh, communicate and educate our community a little bit better. Uh, our next steps is to return at our next council meeting, which won't be till next month, and bring you some uh, possible solutions and a resolution because we can't implement the uh, level two until we have your direction and your approval. And we'll have much more details at that point, uh, more about our education, more about our goals. Um, but uh, as we all know, it's a very serious situation right now. Um, and our water department's taking that very seriously. So I'm here with any questions I can help you with at this time. Okay, uh, Daryl, so if someone has not received a notice, a notice or notification of any kind, are they to assume they're in compliance? That, that's a great question. We're, matter of fact, we're putting together a flyer that's going to be going out in the billings for everybody in the community. So they're going to be educated on where they're at, how much they uh, typically should be using per household. For example, the uh, generic number is about 10,000 gallons per month for a, a household. Um, if they're exceeding that, we have a program now that will know whether it is exceeding that and we will contact them until our app program is put online. So we will be doing that outreach to those who are exceeding those numbers that are typically um, allowed at this level. Okay. Um, all right, but you need, and you need council direction come August for, for what? To move to a level two restrictions, a, a more restricted level and target and implementation of the fines at that okay. point if we choose to do so. Okay. All right, council members, any, does anybody have any questions? No others. I would love to have those slides. Is there a way you could email? I mean, I would like to have them. If everybody wants them, they can. Absolutely, we'll be glad to do that. Okay, I would appreciate having those slides. It answers questions that I know residents ask me all the time um, as to where we are, and that would be very helpful. Okay. Absolutely, Mary, and it's good that we meet with them individually because there's there's a funky uh, formula where 3.25 people persons per household generate so much water. But you know, not every household has three, three and a quarter people living in them. Some have eight people, some have two people. So those numbers will vary and we'll work with the residents um, on what we find out in the field to make sure no one's penalized unwarranted. So yeah, no, no, I understand. I just want to know how how people know. People are asking what, what are the rules, you know, and, and yeah, exactly. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Jimmy, is there anything else in your report? No, that concludes my report, Mayor. Okay. And that brings us to Andy, City Attorney's report. Uh, yes, I have no report, but okay. we do have a closed session, which I'm happy to announce for you Please. if you like. Please do. All right. The closed session is a conference with labor negotiators, collective bargaining units, pursuant to um, Government Code Section 54957.6 and Gilroy Code Section 17A114. Collective bargaining units are AFSCME Local 101, confidential non-exempt employees. City negotiators are Jimmy Forbes and Leanne McPhillips. Anticipated issues are wages, hours, benefits, working conditions. A memorandum of understanding, City of Gilroy and AFSCME Local 101 representing employees affiliated with AFSCME Local 101. Um, so we don't have to take a vote to go into closed session, but when you get into closed session, you must take a vote on whether or not to stay in closed session. Okay. Um, does anyone need like a minute or two break before we go into closed session? And you should ask for public comment on this item also now. Okay. And all right, let me do that first. Do we have, is there any public comment on this item? None. Okay. Then. Like through. Okay, so keep going. Okay, I'm going to need to excuse myself after we get started because <laughs> I, I have I have not put myself off screen yet. But okay, I'm happy to keep going. Um, so let's uh, take a vote to remain in closed session. Well, no, right? no, wait a minute. We have to to go in closed session. We have to make sure the room is cleared properly. No. Is, is Leanne doing that or Jimmy? I'll, I'll do it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'll do it. 
And I see that Facebook is still on as well. I can shut that off too.